open your ears. For which of you will stop the vent of hearing when loud rumor speaks? I, from the Orient to the drooping West, making the wind my post horse, still unfold the acts commenced on this ball of earth. Upon my tongue's continual slanders ride, which in every language I pronounce, stuffing the ears of men with false reports. I speak of peace, while covert enmity under the smile of safety wounds the world. And who but rumour, who but only I, make fearful musters and prepared defence, whilst the big year, swollen with some other grief, is thought with child by the stern tyrant war, and no such matter. Rumour is a pipe, blown by surmises, jealousies, conjectures, and of so easy and so plain a stop that the blunt monster with uncounted heads, the still discordant, wavering multitude, can play upon it. But what need I thus my well-known body to anatomize among my household? Why is rumour here? I run before King Harry's victory who in a bloody field by Shrewsbury hath beaten down young Hotspur and his troops, quenching the flame of bold rebellion, even with the rebels' blood. But what mean I to speak so true at first? My office is to noise abroad that Harry Monmouth fell under the wrath of noble Hotspur's sword, and that the king before the Douglas rage stooped his anointed head as low as death. This have I rumoured through the peasant towns between that royal field of Shrewsbury and this worm-eaten hold of ragged stone where Hotspur's father, old Northumberland, lies crafty sick. The posts come tiring on, and not a man of them brings other news than they have learned of me. From rumours' tongues they bring smooth comforts false, worse than true wrongs. Who keeps the gate here? Who? Oh. What shall I say you are? Tell thou the Earl that Lord Bardolph doth attend him here. His lordship is walked forth into the orchard. Please it, your honour, knock but at the gate, and he himself wilt answer. Here comes the Earl. Uh. What news, Lord Bardolph? Every minute now should be the father of some stratagem. The times are wild. Contention, like a horse full of high feeding, madly hath broke loose and bears down all before him. Noble Earl, I bring you certain news from Shrewsbury. Good, and God will. As good as heart can wish. The king is almost wounded to the death, and, in the fortune of my lord your son, Prince Harry slain outright, and both the blunts killed by the hand of Douglas. Young Prince John and Westmoreland and Stafford fled the field, and Harry Monmouth, the Hulk Sir John, is prisoner to your son. Oh, such a day, so fought, so followed, and so fairly won, came not till now to dignify the times since Caesar's fortunes. How is this derived? Saw you the field, came you from Shrewsbury. I spake with one, my lord, that came from thence, a gentleman well-bred and of good name, that freely rendered me these news for true. Here comes my servant Travers, whom I sent a Tuesday last to listen after news. My lord, I overrode him on the way, and he is furnished with no certainties more than he haply me retell from me. Uh, now, Travers, what good tidings comes with you? My lord, uh, Sir John Umbreville turned me back with joyful tidings and being better horsed, outrode me. After him came spurring hard a gentleman, almost forspent with speed, that stopped by me to breathe his blooded horse. He asked the way to Chester, and of him I did demand what news from Shrewsbury. 
he told me that rebellion had bad luck and that young Harry Percy's spur was called. With that, he gave his able horse the head and bending forward, struck his armed heels against the panting sides of his poor jade up to the rowel head. And starting so, he seemed in running to devour the way, uh, staying no longer a question. Uh -huh. Again, said he young Harry Percy's spur was cold of hot spur, cold spur, that rebellion had met ill luck. My lord, I'll tell you what, if my young lord your son have not the day, upon mine honour, for a silken point, I'll give my barony. Never talk of it. But why should that gentleman that rode by Travers give then such instances of loss? Who? He? He was some hildling fellow that had stolen the horse he rode on, and upon my life spoke at a venture. Look. Here comes more news. Yeah, this man's brow, like to a title leaf, foretells the nature of a tragic volume. So looks the strand whereon the imperious flood hath left a witnessed usurpation. Say, Morton, didst thou come from Shrovesbury? I ran from Shrovesbury, my noble lord, where hateful death put on his ugliest mask to fright our party. Now doth my son and brother, thou tremblest, and the whiteness in thy cheek is apter than thy tongue to tell thy errand. Even so such a man, so faint, so spiritless, so dull, so dead in look, so woe begone, drew Priam's curtain in the dead of night, and would have told him half his Troy was burnt. But Priam found the fire, ere he his tongue. And I, my Percy's death, ere thou reportst it. This thou wouldst say, your son did thus and thus, your brother thus. So fought the noble Douglas, stopping my greedy ear with their bold deeds. But in the end, to stop my ear indeed, thou hast a sigh to blow away this praise, ending with brother, son, and all are dead. Douglas is living. And your brother yet, but for my lord your son. Why, he is dead. See what a ready tongue suspicion hath. He that but fears the thing he would not know hath by instinct knowledge from others' eye that what he feared is chance said. Yet speak. Morton, tell thou an earl his divination lies, and I will take it as a sweet disgrace, and make thee rich for doing me such wrong. You are too great to be by me gainsaid. Your spirit is too true, your fears too certain. Yet for all this, say not that Percy's dead. I see a strange confession in thine eye. Thou shakest thy head and holdst it, fear or sin, to speak a truth. If he be slain, say so. The tongue offends not that reports his death, and he doth sin that doth belie the dead. Not he which says the dead is not alive. Yet the first bringer of unwelcome news hath but a losing office, and his tongue sounds ever after as a sullen bell, remembered tolling a departing friend. I cannot think, my lord. Your son is dead. I am sorry I should force you to believe that which I would to God I had not seen. But these my eyes saw him in bloody state, rendering faint quittance, wearied and outbreath to Harry Monmouth, 
whose swift wrath beat down the never daunted Percy to the earth, from whence with life he never more sprung up. In few his death, whose spirit lent a fire even to the dullest peasant in his camp, bring brute at once, took fire and heat away from the best tempered courage in his troops. For from his metal was his party steeled, which once in him abated, all the rest turned on themselves like dull and heavy lead. And as the thing that's heavy in itself upon enforcement flies with greater speed, so did our men. <sighs> heavy in Hotspur's loss, lend to this weight with such lightness with their fear that arrows fled not swifter toward their aim than did our soldiers, aiming at their safety, fly from the field. Then was that noble Worcester too soon taken prisoner, and that furious Scot, the bloody Douglas, whose well-laboring sword had three times slain the appearance of the king, gan veil his stomach and did grace the shame of those that turned their backs, and in his flight, stumbling in fear, was took. The sum of all is that the king has, hath won and hath sent out a speedy power to encounter you, my lord, under the conduct of young Lancaster and Westmoreland. This is the news at full. All this I shall have time enough to mourn. <laughs> In poison there is physic, and these news, having been well, that would have made me sick. Being sick have in some measure made me well. And as the wretch whose fever weakened joints like strengthless hinges buckle under life, impatient of his fit, breaks like a fire out of his keeper's arms, even so my limbs, weakened with grief, being now enraged with grief, are thrice themselves. Hence, therefore, thou nice crutch, a scaly gauntlet now with joints of steel must glove this hand, and hence thou sickly cries, thou art a guard too wanton for the head which princes fleshed with conquest aim to hit. Now bind my brows with iron. And approach the ragged tower that time and spite dare bring to frown upon the enraged Northumberland. Let heaven kiss earth. Now let not nature's hand keep the wild flood and confined. Let order die. And let this world be no longer a stage to feed contention in a lingering act. But let one spirit of the firstborn Cain reign in all bosoms, that each heart being set on bloody courses, the rude scene may end, and darkness be the barrier of the dead. This strained passion doth you wrong, my lord. Sweet Earl, divorce not wisdom from your honour, but the lives of all your loving compasses lean on your health, the which, if you give o'er to stormy passion, must perforce decay. You cast the event of war, my noble lord, and some the accompt on, of chance before you said, let us make head. It was your pre-surmise that in the dole of blows your son might drop. You knew he walked o'er perils on an edge, more likely to fall in than to go o'er. You were advised his flesh was capable of wounds and scars and that his forward spirit would lift him where most trade of danger ranged. Yet, did you say go forth? And none of this, though strongly apprehended, could restrain the stiff-born action. What hath then befallen? Of what did this bold enterprise bring forth more than that being which was like to be? We all that are engaged to this loss knew that we ventured on such dangerous seas that if we wrought our life, twas ten to one. And yet we ventured, for the gain proposed choked the respect of likely peril feared. And since we are or set, venture again. Come, we will all put forth body and goods. Tis more than time. 
and my most noble lord, I hear for certain and dare speak the truth. The gentle Archbishop of York is up with well-appointed powers. He is a man who with a double surety binds his followers. My Lord, your son had only but the corpse, but shadows and the shows of men to fight. And that same word, rebellion, did divide the action of their bodies from their souls. And they did fight with queasiness, constrained as men drink potions, that their weapons only seemed on our side. But for their spirits and souls, this word rebellion, it had froze them up as fish are in a pond. But now the bishop turns insurrection to, re to religion. Suppose sincere and holy in his thoughts, he's followed both with body and with mind and doth enlarge his rising with the blood of fair King Richard, scraped from pomfret stones, derives from heaven his quarrel and his cause. Tells them he doth bestride a bleeding land gasping for life on the great Bullingbrook, and more on and less to flock to follow him. I knew of this before, but to speak truth, this present grief had wiped it from my mind. Go in with me and counsel every man the aptest way for safety and revenge. Get posts and letters and make friends with speed. Never so few, and yet, Never yet more need. Stira, you giant, what says the doctor to my water? He said, sir. The water itself was a good, healthy water, but for the party that owed it, he might have more diseases than he knew for. Men of all sorts take a pride to gird at me. The brain of this foolish, compounded clay man is not able to invent anything that tends to laughter more than I invent or is invented on me. I am not only witty in myself, but the cause that wit is in other men. I do here walk before thee like a sow that hath overwhelmed all her litter but one. If the prince put thee into my service for any other reason than to set me off, why then I have no judgment. Thou horse and man, Drake, thou art fitter to be worn in my cap than to wait at my heels. I was never manned with an agate till now, but I will inset you neither in gold nor silver, but in vile apparel. Send you back again to your master for a jewel. The juvenile, the prince, your master, whose chin is not yet fledged, I will sooner have a beard grow in the palm of my hand than he shall get one on his cheek, and yet he will not stick to say his face is a face royal. God may finish it when he will. Tis not a hair amiss yet. He may keep it still at a face royal, for a barber shall never earn sixpence out of it, and yet he'll be crowing as if he'd written man ever since his father was a bachelor. He may keep his own grace, but he's almost out of mine, I can assure him. What said Master Donaldson about the satin for my short cloak and my slaps? He said, sir, you should pursue him better assurance than barber. He would not take his band and yours. He liked not the security. Let him be damned like a glutton. Pray God his tongue be hotter. A horse and a chidafel. A rascally ya forsooth knave to bear a gentleman in hand and then stand upon security. Oh, the horse and smooth pates do now wear nothing but high shoes and bunches of keys at their girdles. And if a man is through with them and on his taking up, then they must stand upon security. <laughs> I, I had as leaf, they would put uh, rat's bane in my mouth as offered to stop it with security. I looked, he should have sent me two and 20 yards of satin as I am a true knight and he sends me security. Well, he may sleep in security. For he hath the horn of abundance, and the lightness of his wife shines through it. <laughs> and yet cannot he see that he have his own lantern to light him? <laughs> Where's Bardolf? He's gone into Smithfield to buy your worship poor horse. 
I bought him in Paul's and he'll buy me a horse in Smithfield. And I could get me but a wife in the stews. I were manned, horsed, and wired. Sir, here comes the nobleman that committed the prince for striking him. Uh, wait close. I will not see him. What's he that goes there? A uh, false staff, when it please your lordship. He that was in question for the robbery. He, my lord, but he hath since done good service at Shrewsbury, and as I hear, is now going with some charge to the Lord John of Lancaster. What, to York? Call him back again. To John Falstaff. Boy, tell him I'm deaf. He must speak louder. My master is deaf. I am sure he is to the hearing of anything good. Go pluck him by the elbow. I must speak with him. <clears throat> Sir John? What, a young knave in begging? Is there not wars? Is there not employment? Does the king lack subjects? Do not the rebels need soldiers? Though it be a shame to be on any side but one, it is worse a shame to beg than to be on the worst side. Were it worse that the name of rebellion can tell how to make it? <clears throat> you mistake me, sir. Why, sir, did I say you were an honest man? <laughs> Setting my knighthood and my soldiership aside, I had lied in my throat if I had said so. I pray you, sir, then set your knighthood and our soldiership aside and give me leave to tell you you lie in your throat if you say I am any other than an honest man. I give thee leave to tell me so. I lay aside that which grows to me. If thou gets any leave of me, hang me. If thou taste leave, thou wert better be hanged. You hunt counter hence avant sir my lord would speak with you sir john falstaff a word with you ah my good lord god give your lordship good time of day i am glad to see your lordship abroad i heard say your lordship was sick I hope your lordship goes abroad by advice. Your lordship, though not clean past your youth, hath yet some smack of age in you, some relish of the saltness of time, and I most humbly beseech your lordship to have a reverent care of your health. Sir John, I sent for you before your expedition to Shrewsbury. And please, your lordship, I hear his majesty is returned with some discomfort from Wales. I talk not of his majesty. You would not come when I sent for you. And I hear, moreover, his highness has fallen into this same horse and uh, apoplexy. Well, God mend him. I pray you, let me speak with you. This apoplexy is, as I take it, a kind of lethargy. And please, your lordship, a kind of um, sleeping in the blood, a, a horse and tingling. What tell you me of it? Be it as it is. It hath its original from much grief from study and perturbation of the brain. I've read the cause of his effects in uh, Galen. Uh, it is a kind of deafness. Mm -hmm. yes, I, I think you are fallen into the disease, for you hear not what I say to you. Very well, my lord. Very well. Rather than please you, it is the disease of not listening, the malady of not marking that I am troubled with. To punish you by the heels would amend the attention of your ears, and I care not if I do become your physician. I'm as poor as Job, my lord, but not so patient. Your lordship may minister the potion of imprisonment to me in respect of poverty, but how should I be your patient to follow your prescriptions? Hmm? The wise may make some dram of a scruple, or indeed uh, a scruple itself. I sent for you when there were matters against you for your life to come speak with me. As I was then advised by my learned counsel and the laws of this land service, I did not come. Well, the truth is, Sir John, you live in great infamy. He that buckles him in my belt cannot live unless. 
Your means are very slender and your waist is great. I would have were otherwise. I would my means were greater and my waist slenderer. <laughs> you have misled the youthful prince. Oh, the young prince hath misled me. I am the fellow with the great belly, and he my dog. And I am loath to gall a new healed wound. Your day's service at Shrewsbury hath a little gilded over your night's exploit on Gad's Hill. You may thank the unquiet time for your quiet or posting that action. My lord. But since all is well, keep it so. Wake not a sleeping wolf. To wake a wolf is as bad as to smell a fox. But you are as a candle, the better part burnt out. <laughs> a wassail candle, my lord, all tallow. If I did say of wax, my growth would approve the truth. There, there is not a white hair on your face, but should have his effect of gravity. Uh, his effect of gravy. 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 You follow the young prince up and down like his ill angel. Not so, my lord. Your ill angel is light. But I hope he that looks upon me will take me without weighing. <laughs> and yet in some respects, I grant, I cannot go. I cannot tell. Virtue is of so little regard in this uh, costermonger times that true valor is turned bareherd. Pregnancy is made a tapster and has his quick wit wasted in giving reckonings. All the other gifts uh, are pertinent to man as the uh, malice of this age shapes them are not worth a gooseberry. You that are old, Consider oh. not the capacities of us that are young. You do measure the heat of our livers with the bitterness of your galls. And we <laughs> that are in the veyward of our youth, I must confess, are wags too. Do you set your name in the scroll of youth that are written <laughs> down oak with all the characters of age? <laughs> Have you not a moist eye, a dry hand? A yellow cheek, a white beard, a decreasing leg, an increasing belly? Is not your voice broken, your wind short, your chin double, your wit single, and every part about you blasted with antiquity? <laughs> and you yet call yourself young? Fie, 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 Sir John. My lord, I was born about three of the clock in the afternoon with a white head and something of a round belly. For my voice, I've lost it with hallowing and singing of anthems. To approve my youth further, I will not. The truth is, I am only old in judgment and understanding. And he that will caper with me for a thousand marks let him lend me the money and have at him. <laughs> For the box of the ear that the prince gave you, he gave it like a rude prince, and you took it like a sensible lord. I have checked him for it, and the young lion repents. <laughs> Mary not in ashes and sackcloth, but in new silk and old sack. And God send the prince a better companion. Mm. <laughs> God send the companion a better prince. I cannot rid my hands of him. Well, the king hath severed you and Prince Harry. I hear you are going with Lord John of Lancaster against the Archbishop and the Earl of Northumberland. Yeah, I think you're pretty sweet wit for it. But look, you pray, all you that uh, kiss my lady peace at home, that our armies join not in a hot day. For by the Lord, I take but two shirts out with me, and I mean not to sweat extraordinarily. If it be a hot day and I brandish anything but a bottle, I would I might never spit white again. There is not a dangerous action can peep out this head, but I am thrust upon it. Well, I cannot last forever. But it was always yet the trick of our English nation. If they have a good thing to make it too common, <laughs> if you will need say I'm an old man, you should give me rest. I would to God my name were not so terrible to the enemy as it is. I were better to be eaten to death with a rust than to be soured and scoured to nothing with perpetual motion. Well, be honest. Be honest. And God bless your expedition. 
Will your lordship lend me a thousand pound to furnish me for it? <laughs> Not a penny. Not a penny. You are too impatient to bear crosses. Farewell. Commend me to my cousin Westmoreland. Mm. Mm. If I do, fillip me with a three-man beetle. A man can no more separate age and covetousness than he can part young limbs and lechery. But the gout galls the one and the pox pinches the other, and so both the degrees prevent my curses, boy. Sir? What money is in my purse? Seven grots and two pence. I can get no remedy against this consumption of the purse. Borrowing only lingers and lingers it out, but the disease is incurable. Uh, go bear this letter to my Lord of Lancaster, this to the Prince, this to the Earl of Westmoreland, and uh, <laughs> this <laughs> to old Mistress Ursula, who I am weakly sworn to marry since I perceived the first white hair on my chin. Hmm? About it. You know where to find me. of this gout or a gout of this pox for the one or the other plays the rogue with my great toe yeah. tis no matter if I do halt I have the wars for my color and my pension shall seem the more reasonable a good wit will make use of anything I will turn diseases to commodity Thus have you heard our cause and known our means. And my most noble friends, I pray you all speak plainly your opinions of our hopes. And first, Lord Marshal, what say you to it? I will allow the occasion of our arms, but gladly would be better satisfied how in our means we should advance ourselves to look with forehead bold and big enough upon the power and puissance of the king. Our present musters grow upon the file to five and 20,000 men of choice and our supplies live largely in the hope of great Northumberland whose bosom burns with an insensitive fire. The Very question, injuries. Lord Hastings, stand thus. Whether our present five and twenty thousand may hold up head without Northumberland? With him we may. Yea, marry, there's the point. But if without him we be thought too feeble, my judgment is we should not step too far till we had his assistance by the hand. For in a theme so bloody-faced as this, Conjecture, expectation, and surmise of aids incertain should not be admitted. It is very true, Lord Bardolph, for indeed it was young Hotspur's case at Shrewsbury. It was, my lord, who lined himself with hope, eating the air on promise of supply, flattering himself in project of a power much smaller than the smallest of his thoughts, and so, with great imagination proper to madmen, led his powers to death, and winking, leapt into destruction. But by your leave, it never yet did hurt to lay down likelihoods of forms and hope. Yes, if this present quality of war, indeed the instant action, a cause on foot, lives so in hope as in an early spring we see the appearing buds which to prove fruit hope gives not so much warrant as despair that frosts will bite them. When we mean to build, we first survey the plot, then draw the model, and when we see the figure of the house, then must we rate the cost of the erection, which if we find outweighs ability, what would we do then but anew the draw the model? In fewer offices, or at last, desist to build at all. Much more in this great work, which is almost to pluck a kingdom down and set another up, should we survey the plot of situation and the model, 
consent upon a sure foundation, question surveyors, know our own estate, how able to such a work to undergo, to weigh out against the opposite. Or else we fortify in paper and in figures, using the names of men instead of men, like one that draws the model of a house beyond his power to build it, who, half through, gives o'er and leaves his part created cost a naked subject to the weeping clouds and waste for churlish tyranny. Grant that our hopes, yet likely of fair birth, should be stillborn, and that we now possessed the utmost man of expectation. I think we are a body strong enough, even as we are, to equal with the king. What? Is the king but five and twenty thousand? To us no more. Nay, not so much, Lord Bartolf. For his divisions, as the times do brawl, are in three heads. One power against the French and one against Glendower. Perforce a third must take us up. So is the unfirm king in three divided and his coffers sound with hollow poverty and emptiness. That he should draw his several strengths together and come against us in full puissance need not be dreaded. If he should do so, he leaves his back unarmed, the French and Welsh baying him at the heels. Never fear that. Who is it like should lead his forces hither? The Duke of Lancaster and Westmoreland, against the Welsh, himself and Harry Monmouth. But who is substituted against the French, I have no certain notice. Let us on and publish the occasion of our arms. The Commonwealth is sick of their own choice, their over-greedy love hath surfeited. In habitation giddy and unsure hath he that buildeth on the vulgar heart. O oh, thou fond many, with what loud applause didst thou beat heaven with blessing bowling broke before he was what thou wouldst have him be? Now, being trimmed in thine own desires, thou beastly feeder art so full of him that thou provokest thyself to cast him up. So, so, thou common dog, didst thou disgorge thy glutton bosom of the royal Richard, and now thou wouldst eat thy dead vomit up and house to find it. What trust is in these times? They that when Richard lived would have him die, are now become enamoured on his grave. Thou that threwst dust upon his goodly head when through proud London he came sighing on after the admired heels of bowling broke, Christ now, oh, uh, yield us that king again and take thou this. Oh, thoughts of men are cursed. Past and to come seems best, things present worst. Uh, shall we go draw our numbers and set on? We are time subjects and time bids be gone. Master, m must, Master Fang, H have you entered the action? Oh, it is entered. Oh, where's your yeoman? Is the lusty yeoman? <laughs> Will he stand to it? Sirrah, where's Snare? Oh, Lord, I, good Master Snare. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Snare. We must arrest Sir John Falstaff. Yea, good Master Snare. I have entered him and all. It may chance cost some of us our lives, but he will stab. Oh, alas, the day. Oh, take heed of him. He stabbed me in mine own house, and that most beastly. Oh, in good faith, he cares not what mischief he does. If his weapon be out... He will foin like any devil. He will spare neither man, woman, nor child. If I can close with him, 
I care not for his thrust. No, nor no, I neither. Well, I'll be at your elbow. And I but fists him once, and he come but within my vice. <laughs> oh, I am undone by his going. I warrant you, he's an infinitive thing upon my score. Oh, good Master Fang, hold him sure. Good Master Snare, <laughs> let him not scape. He comes contuently to Pie Corner. Oh, saving your manhoods <laughs> to buy a saddle. And he is indicted to dinner to the lubber's head in Lumbert Street to the master smooths the milkman. Oh, I pray you, since my exion is entered and my case so openly known to the world, let him be brought into his answer. A hundred mark is a long one for a poor lone woman to bear. And I have born and born and born have been fubbed off and fubbed off and fubbed off from this day to that day that it is a shame to be thought on. There is no honesty in such dealing unless a woman should be made an ass and a beast to bear every knave's wrong. Oh, yonder he comes and that errant malmsy nose barred off with him. Well, do your offices? Do your offices? <clears throat> Master Fang, Master Snare, do me, do me, do me your offices. Oh no. Whose mare's dead? What's the matter? Sir John, I arrest you at the suit of Mistress Quickly. <laughs> Away, Violet! Draw a bard off, cut me off the villain's head, throw the queen in the channel. Throw me in the channel? I'll throw thee in the channel. Wilt thou? Wilt thou? Thou bastardly rogue. Murder! Murder! Oh, thou honeysuckle villain. Wilt thou kill God's officers and the king's? Oh, thou honeyseed rogue. Thou art a honeyseed, a man queller, and a woman queller. Keep them off, Bardolf. A rescue! A rescue! Oh, good people, bring a rescue or two! Oh, thou what? What thou? Thou what? What ta? <laughs> do, do thou rogue! Do thou hemp seed! Away, you scullion! You rampallion! You <gasps> fustalarian! Oh. Uh, I'll tickle your catastrophe! What is the matter here? Keep the peace, ho! Oh, oh um, good, my lord. Uh, be, be good to me. I beseech you, stand to me. Oh, now, Sir John, what are you brawling here? Does this become your place, your time, your business? You should have been well on your way to York. Stand from him, fellow. Wherefore hangst upon him? Oh, most worshipful lord, and please your grace, I am a poor widow of East Cheap, and, and he is arrested at my suit. For what sum? Well, it is more than for some, my lord. It, it is for all, all that I have. He hath eaten me out of house and home. He hath put all my substance into that mm. fat belly of his. But I will have some of it out again. Or I will ride thee, O oh knights, like the mare. I think I am as like to ride the mare, if I have any vantage of ground to get up. How comes this, Sir John? By what man of good temper would endure this tempest of exclamation? Are you not ashamed to enforce a poor widow to so rough a course to come by her own? What is the gross sum that I owe thee? Marry, if thou wert an honest man, thyself and the money too. Thou didst swear to me upon a parcel gilt goblet, sitting in my dolphin chamber at the round table by a sea coal fire upon Wednesday and Weeson week. Thou didst swear to me then, as I was washing thy wound, to marry me and make me my lady and thy wife. Nor canst thou deny it. 
Oh, did it not? Good wife Keach, the butcher's wife. Come in then and call me gossip quickly. Coming in to borrow a mess of vinegar? Telling us she had a good dish of prawns? Whereby thou dost desire to eat some? Whereby I told thee they were ill for a green wound? Hmm? And didst thou not, when she was gone downstairs, desire me to be no more so familiarity with such poor people, saying that ere long they should call me madam, <coughs> madam. <laughs> and didst thou not kiss me and bid me fetch thee thirty shillings? I put thee now to thy book oath. Deny it, if thou canst. My lord, this is a poor mad soul. And she says up and down the town that her eldest son is like you. She hath been in good case. And the truth is, poverty hath distracted her. But for these foolish officers, I beseech you, I may have redress against them. Sir John, Sir John, I am well acquainted with your manner of wrenching the true cause the false way. It is not a confident brow, nor the throng of words that come with such more than impudent sauciness from you can thrust me from a level consideration. You have, as it appears to me, practiced upon the easy yielding spirit of this woman and made her serve her your uses both in purse and in person. Yea, in truth, my lord. Pretty peace. Pay her the debt you owe her, and unpay the villainy you have done her. The one you may do with sterling money, and the other with current repentance. My lord, I will not undergo this sneep without reply. You call honourable boldness impudent sauciness. If a man will make curtsy and say nothing, he is virtuous. No, my lord. A humble duty, remember, I will not be your suitor. I say to you, I do desire deliverance from these officers, being upon hasty employment in the king's affairs. You speak as having power to do wrong, but answer in the effect of your reputation and satisfy this poor woman. Come here, the hostess. A nice <clears throat> A nice now Master Gower, what news? The King, my Lord, and Harry, Prince of Wales, is near at hand. The rest, the paper tells. As I am a gentleman. Faith, you said so before. As I am a gentleman, come no more words of it. Oh, by this heavenly ground I tread on. I must be fain to pawn both my plate and the tapestry of my dining chambers. Glasses. Glasses is the only drinking. And for thy walls, a, a pretty slight drollery or, or, or the story of the prodigal or the, the German hunting in waterwork is worth a thousand of these bed hangers and these fly-bitten tapestries. Let it be ten pound, if thou canst. Come, and twere not for thy humours, there's not a better wench in England. Go wash thy face, and draw the action. Come, thou must not be in this humour with me. Dost thou know me? Dost not know me? Come, come, I know thou wast set on this. Pray thee, said John, <laughs> let it be but twenty nobles. If faith, I, I am loath to pawn my plate. Oh, so God save me, La. Let it alone, I'll make other shift. You'll be a fool still. Well, well, well you, you shall have it. Oh, though I pawn the gown. <laughs> I, I, I hope you'll come to supper. You'll pay me all together. Will I live? Go with her. Go with her. Hook on. Hook on. Um, will you have 
doll tear sheet meet you at supper. <laughs> no more words. <laughs> Let's have her. I have heard better news. What's the news, my lord? Where lay the king last night? At Basingstoke, my lord. I hope my lord all's well. What is the news, my lord? Come all his forces back. No. A 1,500 foot, 500 horse, are march up to my lord of Lancaster against Northumberland and the archbishop. Comes, Comes the, the king back from Wales, my noble lord? You shall have letters of me presently. Come, go along with me, good Master Gower. My lord! What's the matter? Master Gower, shall I entreat you uh, with me to dinner? Uh, I must wait upon my good lord here. I thank you, good Sir John. Sir John, you loiter here too long, being you are to take soldiers up in counties as you go. Will you sup with me, Master Gower? What foolish master taught you these manners, Sir John? Master Gower! <laughs> if they become me not, he was a fool that taught them me. This is the right fencing grace, my lord. Tap for tap, and so part fair. Now oh, the lord lighten thee. Thou art a great fool. <laughs> yeah. Oh, before God, I am exceeding weary. Is come to that? I had thought weariness dirt not have attached one of so high blood. Oh, faith, it doth me, though it discolours the complexion of my greatness to acknowledge it. Oh, doth it not show vilely in me to desire small beer? Oh. Why, a prince should not be so loosely studied as to remember so weak a composition. Oh, belike then, my appetite was not princely got, for by my troth I do now remember the poor creature's small beer. Oh, but indeed these humble considerations make me out of love with my greatness. What a disgrace is it to me to remember thy name, or to know thy face tomorrow, or to take note how many pair of silk stockings thou hast? These, these, oh, and, and those that were thy peach-coloured ones, oh, to bear the inventory of thy shirts, as one for superfluity and another for use. But that the tennis court keeper knows better than I, for it is a low ebb of linen with thee when thou keepest not racket there, as thou hast not done a great while, because the rest of thy low countries have made a shift to eat up thy Holland, and God knows whether those that fall out the ruins of thy linen shall inherit his kingdom. But the midwives say the children are not in the fault whereupon the world increases and kindreds are mightily strengthened. How ill it follows. After you have laboured so hard, you should talk so idly. Tell me, how many good young princes would do so, their fathers being so sick as yours at this time is? Shall I tell thee one thing, Poyne? Yes, faith, and let it be an excellent good thing. Oh, well, it shall serve among wits of no higher breeding than thine. Go to, I stand the push of your one thing that you will tell. Mary, I tell thee, it is not meet that I should be sad now my father is sick. Albeit I could tell thee, as to one it pleases me for a fault of a better, to call my friend, I could be sad. Be sad indeed, too. Well, very hardly upon such a subject. By this hand, thou thinkest me as far in the devil's book as thou and Falstaff for obduracy and persistency. Well, let the end try the man. But I tell thee, my heart bleeds inwardly that my father is so sick. And keeping such vile company as thou art half in reason to take from me all ostentation of sorrow. The, the reason? What wouldst thou think of me if I should weep? I would think thee a most princely hypocrite. It would be every man's thought, and thou art a blessed fellow to think as every man thinks. Never a man's thought in the world keeps the roadway better than thine. 
every man would think me an hypocrite indeed. And what accites your most worshipful thought to think so? Why, because you have been so lewd and so much in graft to Falstaff. Oh, and to thee. But that but by this lie I am well spoke on. I can hear it with mine own ears. The worst that they can say of me is that I am a second brother and that I have a proper fellow of my hands. And those two things, I confess, I cannot help. Oh, by my mass, here comes Bardolph. And the boy that I gave Falstaff. Well, he had him from me Christian. And look, if the fat villain have not transformed him, ape. God save you, Grace. And yours, most noble Bardolph. Come, you virtuous ass. You bashful fool. Must you be blushing? Wherefore bless you now? What a maddenly man at arms are you become? Is it such a matter to get a pottle points maiden head? He calls me in now, my lord through a red, red lattice, and I could discern no part of his face from the window. At last, I spied his eyes, and methought he had made two holes in the our wife's new petticoat, and so peeped through. Has not the boy profited? <laughs> away! Horse and upright rabbit, away! Away! You rascally Alpheus dream, away! Oh, instruct us, boy! What dream, boy? Marry, my lord. Althea dreamed she was delivered of a firebrand, and therefore I call him her dream. Oh, a crown's worth of good interpretation. There it is, boy. <laughs> oh, that this good blossom could be kept from cankers. Well, there is sixpence to preserve thee. And you do not make him be hanged among you. The gallows shall have wrong. Oh, and how doth thy master, Bardo? Well, my lord, um, he heard of your graces coming to town. Um, there's, a, there's a letter for you. Ooh, delivered with good respect. And how doth the marvelous your master? In bodily health, sir. Oof, marry, the immortal part needs a physician, but that moves not him. Though that be sick, it dies not. I do allow this wen to be as familiar with me as my dog, and he holds his place. For look you how he writes. <laughs> John Falstaff, knight. Pfft. Every man must know that. As oft as he has occasion to name himself, even like those that are kin to the kin, for they never prick their finger, but they say, there's some of the king's blood spilt. How comes that, says he, that takes upon him not to conceive? And the answer is, is as ready as a borrower's cap. I am the king's poor cousin, sir. Oh, nay, they will be kin to us, or they will fetch it from Jaffa. But to the letter. Sir John Falstaff, knight to the son of the king, nearest to his father, Harry Prince of Wales, greeting. Why, this is a certificate. Oh, peace. I will imitate the honourable Romans in brevity. He sure means brevity in breath, short-winded. I commend to thee, I commend thee, and I leave thee. Be not too familiar with Coins, for he misuses thy favours so much that he swears thou art to marry his sister Nell. Repent at idle times as thou mayst, and so farewell. Thine by yea and no, which is as much as to say as thou usest him. Jack Falstaff with my familiars, John with my brothers and sisters, and Sir John with all Europe. Oh, my lord, I'll steep this letter in sack and make him eat it. Well, that's to make him eat 20 of his words. But do you use me thus, Ned? Must I marry your sister? God send the wench no worse fortune, but I never said so. Ah, oh, well, thus we play the fools of the time, and the spirits of the wise sit in the clouds and mock us. Is your master here in London? 
Uh, yeah, my lord. Where's up's he? Does the old boar feed in the old Frank? Nah, at the old place, my lord, in uh, in East Cheap. What company? Ephesians, my lord, of the old church. Sup any women with him? None, my lord. But old Mistress Quickly and Mistress Dull Tearsheet. What pagan may that be? A proper gentlewoman, sir, and a kinswoman of my master. Well, even such kin as the parish heifers are to the town bull. <laughs> oh, shall we steal upon them, Ned, at supper? I am your shadow, my lord. I'll follow you. Sirrah, you boy, and Bardolf, no word to your master that I am yet come to town. There's for your silence. I have no tongue, sir. And for my, sir, I'll govern it. Uh, fare you well. Go. This dull tear sheet should be some road. I warrant you as common as the way between St Albans and London. How might we see Falstaff bestow himself tonight in his true colours, and not ourselves be seen? Put on two leathern jerkins and aprons, and wait upon him at his table as drawers. Oh, from a god to a bull! Oh, a heavy dissension. Well, it was Job's case. From a prince to apprentice, a low transformation that shall be mine, for in everything the purpose must weigh with the folly. Follow me, Ned. <laughs> I pray thee, loving wife and gentle daughter, jibe even way unto my rough affairs. Put not you on the visage of the times, and be like them to Percy Troublesome. I have given over. I will speak no more. Do what you will. Your wisdom be your guide. Alas, sweet wife, my honour is at pawn, and but my going, nothing can redeem it. Oh, yet for God's sake, go not through these wars. The time was, father, that you broke your word when you were more endeared to it than now. When your own Percy, when my heart's dear Harry, through many a northward look to see his father bring up his powers, but he did long in vain. Who then persuaded you to stay at home? There were two honours lost, yours and your son's. For yours by the God of heaven brighten it. For his, it stuck upon him as the sun in the grey vault of heaven, and by his light did all the chivalry of England move to do brave acts. He was indeed the glass wherein the noble youth did address themselves. He had no legs that practised not his gait, and speaking thick which nature made his blemish, became the accent of the valiant. For those that could speak low and tardily would turn their own perfection to abuse to seem like him. So that in speech, in gait, in diet, in affections of the light, in merely rules, humours of blood, he was the mark and glass, copy and book that fashioned others. And him, oh wondrous him, oh miracle of man, him did you leave, second to none, unseconded by you, to look upon the hideous god of war in disadvantage, to abide a field where nothing but the sound of Bosper's name did seem defensible. So you left him, never, oh never, do his ghost the wrong to hold your honour more precise and nice with others than with him. Let them alone, the marshal and the archbishop are strong, had my sweet Harry had but half the numbers, today might I hang in an husband's neck and talk on Mama's grave. You show your heart, fair daughter. You, you do draw my spirits from me with new lamenting ancient oversights. I must go and meet with danger there, or it will seek me in another place and find me worse provided. 
fly to Scotland, till that the nobles and the armoured commons have of their puissance made a little taste. If they get ground and vantage to the king, then join you with them like a rib of steel to make strength stronger. But for all our loves, first let them try themselves. So did your son, he was so suffered. So came I a widow and never shall have length of this life enough to rain upon remembrance with mine eyes that it may grow and sprout as high as heaven for recordation of my noble husband. Come, 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 go in with me. Tis with my mind as with the tide swelled up unto his height that makes us still stand running neither way. Fain would I go to meet the Archbishop, but, but many thousand reasons hold me back. I will resolve for Scotland. There am I till time and vantage crave my company. What the devil hast thou brought there? Apple John. Oh no, he said John cannot endure an apple John. Mass, thou sayest true. The prince uh, once set a dish of apple Johns before him right. and told him there were five more Sir Johns and putting off his hat said, I will now take... Uh, Take uh, my leave of these six dry, round, old, withered nights. It angered him to the heart, but he hath forgot. Well, then cover and set them down and see if thou can find out a sneak's noise. Mistress Tearsheet would fain hear some music. A dispatch. The room where they sucked is too hot. They'll come in straight. Sirrah, here will be the prince and Master Poins anon. And they will put on two of our jerkins and our aprons, and Sir John must not know it. Bardolph had brought word. By the mass, he will be old Eutis. <laughs> It'll be an excellent stratagem. I'll see if I can find out Sneak. Oh, a fake sweetheart. Methinks now. You're an excellent good temporality. Your pulsage beats as extraordinarily as heart would desire. And your colour, I warrant you, is as red as any rose. <laughs> In good truth, la. <laughs> but, faith, you have drunk too much canaries. And that's a marvellous searching wine. And it perfumes the blood, air eh, one can say. Ooh, what's this? <laughs> oh, how do you now? Ah, uh, better than I was, eh? Why, that's well said. A good heart's worth gold. <laughs> oh, Lord. <laughs> Here comes there, John. When Arthur first in court began, oh, <coughs> uh, empty the Jordan. <laughs> and was a worthy king. How now, Mistress Doll? Uh, oh, stick ever calm, yea, good faith. Mm, so is all her sect. And they be once in a calm, they are sick. Oh, are you muddy rascal? Is that all the comfort you give me? You make fat rascals, Mistress Doll. I make them? Gluten and diseases make them, I make them not. Oh, if the cook help to make the gluttony, you help to make the diseases, doll. We catch of you, doll. We catch of you. Grant that, my poor virtue. Grant that. Yay. Joy, our chains and our Jew. Hmm. Your brooches, pearls and ouches. For to serve bravely is to come halting off, you know. To come off the breach with his pike bent bravely, and to surgery bravely, to venture upon the charged chambers bravely. Ah, hang yourself, you muddy conger, hang yourself. <laughs> <laughs> my, my troth, this is the old fashion. 
You two never meet, but you fall into some discord. You are both a good truth, as rheumatic as two dry toast. You cannot one bear with another's confirmities. I mean, what the mm-hmm. good year? One must bear, and that must be you. You are the weaker vessel, as they say, the <laughs> emptier vessel. <laughs> Can a weak, empty vessel bear such a huge fool hogshead? There's a whole much adventures of Mordor stuff in him. You have not seen a hook better stuffed in their hold. Come, I'll be friends with thee, Jack. Thou art going to the wars, and whether I shall never see thee again or no, there's nobody cares. <clears throat> uh, sir, Angel Pistons below and uh, would speak with you. Ah, hang him, swaggering rascal, let him come not hinter. It is the fool mounted rogue in England. If he swagger, let him not come here. Oh, no, by my faith, I, I must live among my neighbours. I'll know swaggerers. I am in good name and fame with the very best. Shut the door! Does our here host No swagger is here. I have not lived mm. all this while to have swaggering now. Shut the door, I pray ya! Does thou hear, hostess? Oh, pray ye. Pacify yourself, Sir John. There comes no swagger is here. Does thou hear? It is mine ancient. Ah, tilly folly, Sir John. Here, yeah, tell me. You ancient swaggerer comes not in my doors. I was before Master Tissick, the deputy, t'other day, and as he said to me, it was no longer ago than Wednesday last. Be good faith, neighbour, quickly, says he. Master Dumb, the minister, was by then. Neighbour, quickly, says he. Receive those that are civil for, said he, and are in an ill name. Now he said so, and I can tell whereupon, for, says he, you are an honest woman and well thought on. Therefore, take heed ah, what guest you receive. Receive, says he, no swaggering companions. Well, well, there comes none here. You would bless you to hear what he said. No, I'll no swaggers. He's no swagger, hostess. A tame cheater. If faith, you may stroke him as gently as a puppy greyhound. He'll not swagger with a barbary hen if her feathers turn back in any show of resistance. Call him up, drawer. Cheater? Call you him? Well, I will bar no honest man in my house, nor no cheater. But I do not love swaggerers. By my troth, I am the worst one when one says, Swagger. Oh, <laughs> feel masters how I shake. Look you, I warrant you. So you do, hostess. <laughs> yeah, do I, yeah. In very truth, do I, and twer an aspen leaf. Hmm? I cannot abide swaggerers. <laughs> <laughs> God save you, Sir John! <laughs> Welcome, ancient pistol! <laughs> Here, pistol. I charge you with a cup of sack. Do you discharge upon mine hostess? <laughs> oh, <laughs> I will discharge upon her, Sir John, <laughs> with two bullets! <laughs> She's pistol proof, sir. (laughs) You shall not hardly offend her. (laughs) Come, I'll drink no proofs, nor no bullets. I'll drink no more than will do me good. For no man's pleasure, I. Then to you, Miss Dorothy, I will charge you. (laughs) <laughs> Charge me! I scorn you, scrub companion. 
What? You poor base rascally cheating like line and mate? Away, you moody rogue, away. I am meat for your master. I know you, Mistress Dorothy. <laughs> away, you cut post rascal, you filth bug, away. By this wine, I'll trust my eyes on your moody chaps and you play this saucy cuddle with me. Away, you bought away, you rascal, you basket heeled stale juggler, you. Since when, I pray you, sir, God's light, with two points on your shoulders? <laughs> Much. God, let me not live, but I'll murder your wrath for this. No more, Pistol, I would not have you go off here. Discharge yourself of our company, Pistol. Ah. Um, no. Good Captain Pistol, <laughs> not here, sweet Captain. <laughs> captain, <laughs> thou abominable damn cheater, art thou not ashamed to be called Captain? Hmm? And captains were of my mind, they would trudging you out for taking their names upon you before you have earned them. You are Captain, <laughs> you slave, for what? For tearing a poor horse rough in a body house? He, a captain. <laughs> Hang him, rogue. He lives upon a moldy stew with brooms and dried cakes. A captain. <laughs> God's light. These villains will make their word as odious as the word occupy, which was an excellent good word before it was you sorted. Therefore, captains had need look to it. Yeah. Pray they go down. Good ancient. Hard to hear the mistress doll. I, not I. I tell you what, Corporal Bart, if I could tear her, I'll be revenged of her. I'll see her damn first to put those damned lake by this hand to the infernal deep with Erebus and torches vile also. Hold, hook, line, I say. Down, down, fates! Have we not Hyron here? Ah! Good, Captain Peasel, be quiet! Tis very lighty, Faith. I beseech you now, aggravate your collar. Ah. These be good humours indeed. <laughs> hey, shall pack horses and hollow pampered jades of Asia, which cannot go but 30 mile a day, compare with Caesars and with cannibals and Trojan Greeks? Nay, rather damn them with King Cerberus and let the welkin roar. <laughs> shall, shall we fall foul for toys, hey? Quite <laughs> my troth, Captain. These are very bitter words. Gone, good ancient. This will grow to a brawl and on. Would we'll die men like dogs, give crowds like pins, have we not hiring here? Oh, my word, Captain. There's none such here. What the good year? Do you think I would deny her? For God's sake, be quiet. Well, then feed and be fat, my fair Calypolis. Come, give us some sack. Si fortuna me tormenta, sperato me contenta, eh? Fear we broadsides? No. Let the fiend give fire. Give me some sack and sweetheart. <laughs> Lie thou there. Come we to full points here and a setter as nothings? <laughs> Shall I would be quiet? Oh, sweet night. I kiss thy neef, eh? <laughs> what? We have seen the seven stars. <laughs> oh, for God's sake, trust him downstairs. I cannot endure such a first year rascal. Thrust him downstairs? Know we not Galloway nags? Put him down, Bardolf, like a shove goat shilling. Nay, and he do nothing but speak nothing. He shall be nothing here. Come, get you downstairs. What? Shall we have incision, eh? Shall we embrew, eh? Hey? Then death rock me sleep, abridge my doleful days. Why then let grievous, ghastly, gaping wounds untwine the sisters three? Come, Atropos, I say! Oh, he is goodly stopped toward. 
Give me my rape here, boy. Uh, I, I pray thee, Jack. I pray thee, do not draw. Get thee downstairs. Here's a come out. Oh, I swear keeping house on a floor, I'll be in these turrets and fights! Don't murder, I warrant no. you! Alas! Alas! Put up your naked weapons! Put up your naked weapons! I pay thee, Jack. Be quiet. The rascal is gone. Oh, you sore son, little valiant valiant well you. Oh, are you not hurt in the groin? He thought he made a, a thrust at your belly. Oh, have you turned him out of doors? <sighs> yes, sir. The rascal's drunk. You've heard him in the, in the shoulder. Oh, rascal to brave me. <laughs> oh, you sweet little of you, <laughs> Ayla's poor ape. How the sweat is. Come, come. Let me wipe thy face. Come on, come on, you horse and chops. Mm -hmm. Oh, you rogue. Oh, you fate. I love thee, thou art as valuous as Hector of Troy, worth five of Agamemnon, and ten times better than the nine worthies. Well, villain. A really slave. I will toss the rogue in a blanket. Do, and thou darest for thy heart, and thou dost, I will canvas thee between a pair of sheets. <laughs> Let the musicians play. Play, sirs. Here. Sit on my knee, doll. A rascal, bragging slave. <laughs> the rogue fled from me like quicksilver. Mm -hmm. Thy fate, and thou followest him like a church. Thou whore, some little tidy Bartholomew boar pig. <laughs> when wilt thou leave your fi fighting a days and spawning a night and begin to patch up thine old body for heaven? Peace, good doll. Do not speak like a death's head. Do not bid me remember mine end. Sarah, what humors the prince of? Hmm. Good, shallow young fellow. Mm -hmm. He would have made a good pantler. <laughs> he would have chipped bread well. Uh, they say points has a good wit. Oh, he a good wit? <laughs> Hang him. <laughs> Baboon. <laughs> oh, his wit's as thick as a Tewksbury mustard. Uh, there, there's no more conceit in him than is in a mallet. <laughs> Why does the prince love him so, then? Because. Their legs are both of a bigness. And he plays it quite swell and eats conger and fennel. Drinks off candles' ends for flat dragons. And rides the wild mare with the boys. Jumps upon joined stools. Swears with a good grace. And wears his boots very smooth, like unto the sign of the leg. And breeds no bait with telling of discreet stories and such other gamble faculties he has that show a weak mind and an able body for the which the prince admits him. For the prince himself is such another. <laughs> the weight of a hair will turn the scales between their avatipois. Would not this knave of a wheel have his ears cut off? Let's beat him before his whore. Oh, look where the withered elder hath not his pole clawed like a parrot. Is it not strange that desire should so many years outlive performance? Kiss me, doll. Oh, 
Saturn and Venus this year in conjunction. What says the almanac to that? And look, whether the fiery trigon, his man be not lisping to his master's old tables, his notebook, his council keeper. Let us give me flattering buses. By my truth, I kiss thee with that most constant heart. Mm. Mm. I am old. I am old. I love thee better than I love Eras, curvy young boy of them all. What stuff wilt thou have a cur to love? Hmm? I shall receive money on Thursday. Thou shalt have a cap tomorrow. <laughs> a merry song, come, it grows late. Wheel to bed. Mm -hmm. Don't forget me when I'm gone. By my truth. Thou send me a weeping, and thou said so. Prove that ever I dress handsome to thy return. Well, how can I end? Some sack. Francis! Anon! Anon! Anon, sir! <laughs> oh, bastard son of the kings! And art not thou poins his brother? Why, thou globe of sinful continents, what a life dost thou lead? Eh, better than thou. I am a gentleman, thou art a drawer. Ah, very true, sir. And I come to draw you out by the ears. Oh, the Lord, preserve thy good grace. Ah, by my troth, welcome to London. Now the Lord bless that sweet face of thine. Oh, Jesu, are you come from Wales? Thou horse and mad compound of majesty by this light flesh and corrupt blood. Thou art welcome. How, oh, you fat fool, I scorn you. <laughs> My Lord, he will drive you out of your revenge and turn all to a merriment if you take not the heat. You horse and candle, mind you. How vilely did you speak of me even now before this honest, virtuous, civil gentlewoman? God's blessing of your good heart. And so she is by my troth. <laughs> Didst thou hear me? Yea, and you knew me, as you did when you ran away by Gad's Hill. You knew I was at your back and spoke it on purpose to try my patience. No, 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 not so. I did not think thou wast within hearing. I shall drive you then to confess the willful abuse, and then I know how to handle you. No abuse? How? A mine honor, no abuse? Not to dispraise me, and call me Pantia, and bread chipper, and I know not what. No abuse, how? No abuse. No abuse, Ned. In the world, honest Ned, no abuse, none. I, I, I dispraised him before the wicked that the wicked might not fall in love with him, in which doing I've done the part of a careful friend and a true subject, and thy father is to give me thanks for it. No abuse, how? None, Ned, none. No faith, boys, none. See now whether pure fear and entire cowardice doth not make thee wrong this virtuous gentlewoman to close with us. Is she of the wicked? Is thine hostess here of the wicked? Or is thy boy of the wicked? Or honest Bardolph, whose zeal burns in his nose, of the wicked? Answer, thou dead elm, answer. The fiend hath pricked down Bardolph irrecoverable, and his space is Lucifer's privy kitchen, where he doth nothing but roast malt worms. <laughs> no. uh, for the boy, there's a good angel about him, but the devil outbids him too. For the women? For one of them, she's in hell already and burns poor souls. Mm -hmm. For the other, I owe her money, and whether she be damned for that, I know not. No, I warrant you. 
No, I think thou art not. I think thou art quit for that. Mary, there's another indictment upon thee for suffering flesh to be eaten in thy house, contrary to the law for the which I think thou wilt howl. All victuallers do so. What's a joint of mutton or two and a whole lent, hmm? You gentlewoman. What says your grace? His grace says that which his flesh rebels against. Who oh, not so loud at the door? <sighs> Look to the door there, Francis! Peter, how now? What news? The king, your father, is at Westminster, and there are twenty weak and weary posts come from the north. And as I come along, I met and overtook a dozen captains, bareheaded, sweating, knocking at the taverns, and asking everyone for Sir John Foster. By heaven, point. I feel me much to blame, so idly to profane the precious time when tempest of commotion, like the south born with black vapour, doth begin to melt and drop upon our bare unarmoured heads. Give me my sword and cloak. Falstaff. Good night. Now comes in the sweetest morsel of the night. And we must hence and leave it unpicked. More knocking at the door. How now, what's the matter? You must await a curt, sir, presently. A dozen captains stay at door for you. Pay the musicians, Sirrah. Farewell, hostess. Farewell, door. You see, my good wenches, how men of merit are sought after. <laughs> the underserver may sleep when the man of action is called on. Farewell, good wenches. If I be not sent away post, I will see you again ere I go. I cannot speak if my heart be not ready to burst. Um, well, sweet Jack, have a care of thyself. Farewell. Farewell. Oh, fare thee well. I have known these the 29 years, come peace God time. But an honester and truer heart, I, well, fare thee well. Mistress Tearsheet. What's the matter? Good Mistress Tearsheet. Come to my master. No. Oh, run, doll, run. Run, good doll. Come. She comes blubbered. Hey. Will you come, doll? Go call the Earls of Surrey and of Warwick, but ere they come, bid them read over these letters. Well, consider them. Make good speed. Oh. How many thousand of my poorest subjects are at this hour asleep? Oh, sleep. Oh, gentle sleep, nature's softness, how have I frighted thee that thou no more wilt weigh my eyelids down and steep my senses in forgetfulness? Why, rather sleep, liest thou in smoky cribs upon an easy pallet, stretching thee and hushed with buzzing night flies to thy slumber, than in the perfumed chambers of the great, under the canopies of costly state, and lulled with the sound of sweetest melody. Now oh, the dull 
God, why liest thou with the vile and loathsome beds and leavest the kingly couch a watch case of a common larum bell? And wilt thou in the high and giddy mast seal up a ship boy's eyes and rock his brains hmm? and cradle the rude and pervious surge and the visitation of the winds who take the ruffian bellows by the top, curling their monstrous heads and hanging them with deafening clamor and slippery clouds that thou the hurly death itself awakens. Canst thou, O partial sleep, give repose to the wet sea boy in an hour so rude and in the calmest, most stillest night with all appliances, means to boot deny it to a king? <sighs> And happy low, lie down. Uneasy lies the head that bears a crown. Many good morrows to your majesty. Is it good morrow, lords? It is one o'clock and past. Well then. Good morrow to you all, my lords. Have you read all the letters that I sent you? Uh, we have, my lord. Then you perceive the body of our kingdom, how foul it is, what rank diseases grow, and with what danger near the heart of it. It is but as a body yet tempered, which to his former strength may be restored with good <laughs> advice and little medicine. My lord, Northumberland, will soon be cold. <laughs> God. One might read the book of fate and see the revolution of the times make mountains level and the continent weary of solid firmness melt itself into the sea. And of other times to see the beachy girdle of the ocean too wide for Neptune's hips how chances marks and changes fill the cup of alteration with diverse liquors. <coughs> if this were seen, the happiest youth, viewing his progress through what perils past, what crosses to ensue, would shut the book and sit him down and die. And Tis not ten years gone since Richard and Northumberland, great friends, did feast together. And in two years after were they at wars. It is but eight years since this Percy was the man nearest to my soul, who like a brother toiled in my affairs, and laid his love and life under my foot. Yea, for my sake, even to the eyes of Richard, gave him defiance. But which, which of you was by you? Cousin Neville, as I may remember, when Richard, with his eye brimful of tears, then checked and rated by Northumberland, did speak these words, now <laughs> proved a prophecy. Northumberland, thou ladder by which my cousin Bullingbrook ascends my throne. And then, God knows, I had no such intent but that necessity so bowed the state that I and greatness were compelled to kiss. Oh, the time shall come, thus did he follow it. The time will come that foul sin gathering head shall break into corruption. And so went on foretelling the same times, condition, and division of our amity. There is a history in all men's lives, figuring the nature of the times deceased, the which observed a man may prophesy with near aim of the main chance of things as yet not come to life, which in their seeds and such weak beginnings lie in treasure. Such things become the hatch and brood of time. And by the necessary form of this, King Richard might create a perfect guess that great Northumberland, then false to him, would of that seed grow to a greater falseness, which should not find a ground to root upon unless on you. Are these things then necessities? 
Then let us meet them like necessities. And the same word even now cries out on us. They say that Bishop and Northumberland are 50,000 strong. It cannot be, my lord. <laughs> Rumor doth double, like the voice and echo, the number of the feared. Please it, your grace, to go to bed. <laughs> Upon my soul, my lord, the powers that you already have sent forth shall bring this prize in very easily. Uh, to comfort you the more, I have received a certain instance that Glendower is dead. <laughs> hath been this fortnight ill, and these unseasoned hours perforce must add unto your sickness. I will take your counsel. And were these inward wars once out of hand, we would, dear lords, unto the holy land. Come on, come on, come on, sir. Give me your hand, sir. Give me your hand, sir. An early stirrer by the rood, and how doth my good cousin silence? Good morrow, good cousin Shallow. And how doth my cousin, your bedfellow, and your fairest daughter, and mine, my goddaughter Ellen? Alas, a black oozle, cousin Shallow. Why, yea, and no, sir. I dare say my cousin William has become a good scholar. He is at Oxford still, is he not? Indeed, sir, to my cost. I must then to the inns of court shortly. I was once of Clement's Inn, where I think they will talk of mad shallow yet. You, you were called lusty shallow then, cousin. I the mess. I was called anything. And I would have done anything indeed, too, and roundly, too. There was I and little John Doit of Staffordshire, and black George Barnes, and Francis Pickbone, and uh, Will Squeal, Cotswold man. You had not four such swinge bucklers in all the inns of court again. And I may say so to you, we knew where the Bona Robers were, and had the best of them at all commandment. Then was Jack Falstaff, now Sir John, a boy and page to Thomas Mowbray, Duke of Norfolk. This uh, Sir John cousin that comes hither and on about soldiers? Oh, the same Sir John, the very same. <laughs> I saw him break Skogan's head at the court gate, when there was a crack not thus high, <laughs> and the very same day did I fight with one Samson Stockfish, a fruiterer, behind Gray's Inn. <laughs> oh, Jesu, Jesu, the mad days that I have spent, and to see how many of my old acquaintance are dead. We shall all follow, cousin. Oh, certain to certain, very sure, very sure. Death, as the psalmist saith, is certain to all. All shall die. Our good yoke of bullocks at Stamford Fair. By my troth, I, I was not there. Death is certain. <laughs> is old double of your town living yet? Dead, sir. Jesu, Jesu, dead! Oh, I drew a good bow, and dead. I shot a fine shot. John of Gaunt loved him well and betted much money on his head. Uh, dead. I would have clapped to the club at twelve score, and carried you a forehand shaft of fourteen, a fourteen and a half, that would, would, would have done a man's heart good to see. Uh, how a score of yous now? Thereafter, as they be, a score of good yous may be worth ten pounds. And his old double dead. Here come two of Sir John Falstaff's men, I think. Ah. Good morrow, honest gentlemen. I beseech you. Uh, which is Justice Shallow? 
I am Robert Shallow, sir, a poor esquire of this country and one of the king's justices of the peace. Uh, what is your good pleasure with me? My captain, sir, commends him to you, my captain. Uh, Sir John Falstaff, a tall gentleman by heaven and a most gallant leader. He greets me well, sir. I knew him a good backsword man. Ah. <laughs> I'll dub the good knight. May I ask how my lady, his wife, doth? Sir, pardon, a, a soldier is better accommodated than with a wife. It is well said in faith, sir. It is well said indeed, sir. <laughs> Better accommodated. It is good. Yea, indeed it is. Good phrases are surely and ever were very commendable. Eh, accommodated. It comes of a commodo. Eh, very good. Eh, good phrase. Pardon me, sir. I've heard the word phrase call you it. By this day, I know not the phrase, but I will maintain the word with my sword to be a soldier-like word and a word of exceeding good command by heaven. Accommodated. That is when a man is, as they say, accommodated, or when a, when a man is being whereby he may be thought to be accommodated, which is an excellent thing. Oh, it is very just. Look, mm -hmm. ah, look, here comes good Sir John. Give me your good hand. Give me your worship's good hand by my troth. You like well and bear your years very well. Welcome, <laughs> good Sir John. I am glad to see you well, good Master Robert Shallow. Uh, uh, um, Master Surecard, as I think? Oh, no, no, Sir John. It is my cousin, cousin Silence uh, in commission with me. <sighs> good Master Silence, it well befits you should be of the peace. <laughs> Your good worship is welcome. Oh, <laughs> fie, fie, this is hot weather, gentlemen. Have you provided me here half a dozen sufficient men? Uh, Mary, have we, sir? Uh, will you uh, sit? Hmm. Let me see him, I beseech you. Uh, uh, where's the roll? Where's the roll? Where's the roll? Oh, <laughs> uh, let me see. Let me see. Let me see. So, 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 so. Yes, yeah. Mary, sir. Ralph, Moldy. Uh, let them appear as I call. Let them do so. Let them do so. Let me see. Where is Moldy? Here and please you. Ah, what think you, Sir John? A good limbed fellow. Young, strong, and of good friends. Is thy name Moldy? Yeah, and please you. Tis the more time thou wert used. Mm. <laughs> Most excellent of faith, things that are mouldy lack use. Very singular good. Mm -hmm. Very well said, Sir John. Very well said. <laughs> Prick him. I was pricked well enough before, and you could have let me alone. My old dam will undone now for want to do her husbandry, husbandry and dudgery. You need not have pricked me. There are other men fitter to go out than I. To peace, Moldy, you shall go. Moldy, it is time you were spent. <clears throat> spent? Peace, fellow, peace. Stand aside. Know you where you are. Uh, for the other, Sir John, let me see. Uh, Simon Shadow? Yeah, Mary. Let me have him to sit under. <laughs> He's like to be a cold soldier. <laughs> Shadow. Here, sir. Ah. Uh, Shadow, whose son art thou? My mother's son, sir. Oh, thy mother's son. <laughs> like enough. And thy father's shadow. <laughs> so the son of the female is the shadow of the male. <laughs> 
Yeah, it is often so indeed, but much of the father's substance. <laughs> Do you like him, Sir John? Shadow will serve for summer. Prick him, for we have a number of shadows to fill up the muster book. Uh, Thomas Wart. Where's he? Here, sir. Uh, is thy name Wart? Yea, sir. Thou art a very ragged wart. Shall I prick him down, Sir John? It was superfluous, for his apparel is built upon his back and the whole frame stands upon pins. Prick him no more. <laughs> you can do it, sir. You can do it. I commend you well. Uh, Francis Feeble? Oh, oh, here, sir. Here. Ah. Oh, what what art thou, thou, Feeble? Thou? <laughs> a, a woman's tailor, sir. Shall I prick him, sir? Oh, you may. But if he had been a man's tailor, he'd have pricked you. <laughs> <laughs> Wilt thou make as many holes in an enemy's battle as thou hast done in a woman's petticoat? Oh, I will do my good will, sir. You can have no more. Well said, good woman's tailor. Well said, courageous feeble. Thou wilt be as valiant as the wrathful dove or the most magnanimous mouse. Oh, prick the woman's tailor. Well, Master Shallow, deep, Master Shallow. I would what might have gone, sir. <laughs> oh, I would thou wert a man's tailor that thou mightst mend him and make him fit to go. <laughs> I cannot put him to a private soldier that is the leader of so many thousands. Let that suffice. <laughs> Most forcible feeble. It shall suffice, sir. <laughs> I am bound to thee, reverend feeble. Who's next? Peter Bullcalf or the Green. Yeah, Mary. Let's see Bullcalf. Sir. <clears throat> For God, a likely fellow. Come prick me bull calf till he roar again. <laughs> no, Lord, good my lord captain. <clears throat> Wouldst thou roar before thou art pricked? Oh, Lord, sir, uh, I am a diseased man. What disease hast thou? Oh, a horse in cold, sir. <laughs> <clears throat> um, a cough, sir, which I caught with the ringing in the king's affairs upon his <coughs> coronation day, sir. Come, thou <laughs> shalt go to the wars in a gown. We will have a way with thy cold, and I will take such order that my friends shall ring for thee. I is uh, <laughs> here all? Uh, here is uh, two more cold than your number. Uh, you must have but four here, sir. <laughs> and... Uh, so, I pray you uh, go in with me to dinner. Come, I will go drink with you, but I cannot tarry dinner. I'm glad to see you. I am glad to see you by my troth, Master Shallow. Oh, Sir John, do you remember since we lay all night in the windmill in St. George's Field? <laughs> no more of that, good Master Shallow, no more of that. Uh, Twas a merry night. And is Jane Nightwork? alive. She lives, Master Shallow. She never got away with me. Oh, never, never. She could always say, or she would always say, she could not abide, Master Shallow. <laughs> By the mess I could anger her to the heart. <laughs> she was then a bona roba. Does she hold her own well? Old. Old, Master Shallow. Nay, she must be old. She cannot choose but be old. Certain she's old. And had Robin night work by old night work before I came to Clementine. That, that's 55 year ago. Ah, cousin Silence, that thou hast seen that this night and I have seen. <laughs> Sir John, said I well. We have heard the chimes at midnight. Master Shallow. Oh, that we have, that we have, that we have. In faith, Sir John, we have. Our watchword was, Hem 
boys. Uh, oh, come, let's to dinner. Come, let's to dinner. Jesus, the days that we have seen. Uh, come, come. Um, <clears throat> good, uh, good master corporate Bardolf. Um, uh, stand, my friend. And, and here's, here's four Harry Ten Shillings in French crowns for you. Um, <clears throat> In very truth, sir, I had as leave be hanged, sir, as I go. Uh, yet, for mine own <coughs> part, sir, I do not care, but rather because I'm unwilling, and for mine own part, have a desire to stay with my friends. Else, sir, I did not care for mine own part <coughs> so much. <clears throat> um. Go to stand aside. And good master, corporal, captain, for my old dam's sakes, tell my friend, uh, she has nobody to do anything about her when I'm gone. And she's old and cannot help herself. So you shall have. Forty, sir. Go to stand aside. By my troth, I care not. A man can die but once. We owe God a death. I'll ne'er bear a base mind. Ain't be my destiny. So ain't be not so. <laughs> no man is too good to serve prince and let it go which way it will, and he that dies this year is quiet for the next. Well said. Thou art a good fellow. <laughs> Faith, I'll bear no base mind. Come, sir, which men shall I have? Oh, four of which you please. <laughs> sir, a word with you. I have three pound to free Mouldy and Bull Calf. Go to, well. Come, Sir John, which four will you have? Uh, do you choose for me? Oh, uh, merry then. Uh, Mouldy, Bull Calf, Feeble, and Shadow. <sighs> uh, Mouldy and Bull Calf, uh, for you. Moldy, stay at home till you are past service, and for your part, Bolkov, grow <laughs> till you come unto it. I will none of you. Oh, Sir John, Sir John, do not yourself wrong. They are your likeliest men, and I would have you served with the best. Will you tell me, Master Shallow, how to choose a man? Care I for the limb, the thews, the stature, bulk, and big semblance of a man? Give me. The spirit, Master Shallow. Here's what. You see what a ragged appearance it is? He shall charge you and discharge you with the motion of a pewter's hammer. Come off and on swifter than he that gibbets on the brewer's bucket. And this same half-faced fellow, Shadow, give me this man. He presents no mark to the enemy. The foeman may, with his great aim, level at the edge of a, a, a penknife. And for a retreat, how swiftly will this feeble, the woman's tailor, run off? Oh, give me the spare men and spare me the great ones. Put me a caliber into Ward's hand, Bardolf. Old Ward, traverse. Thus, 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 thus. Come. Manage me your caliber so. Very well, go to. Mm -hmm. Very good, exceeding good. Oh, give me always a little lean, old, chopped, bald spot. Mm -hmm. Well said, a faith. What? Thou art a good scab. Hold! There's a tester for thee. 
Oh, he is not his craft's master. He doth not do it right. I remember at Mile Inn Green when I lay at Clement's Inn, I was then Sir Dagonet in Arthur's show. There was a little quither fellow and would manage you his piece thus, and it would about and about and come you in and come you in and rat ta 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 would say and bounce would he say and away would he go again and away he would come. I shall ne'er see such a fellow. These fellows will do well, Master Shallow. Uh, God keep you, Master Silence. I will not use many words with you. <laughs> Fare you well, gentlemen both. I thank you. I must a dozen mile tonight. Baldoff, give the soldiers coats. Oh, Sir John, the Lord bless you. God prosper your affairs. God send us peace. At your return visit, our house, let our old acquaintance be renewed. A peradventure, I will with ye to the court. Oh, God, I would you would, Master Shalom. Go to. I have spoken a word. God keep you. Fare you well, gentle gentlemen. <laughs> On, Bardolf. Lead the men away. Look. As I return, I will fetch off these justices. I do see the bottom of justice, shallow lord. Lord, how subject we old men are to this vice of lying. <laughs> this same starved justice hath done nothing but prate to me of the wildness of his youth and the feats he hath done about Turnbull Street and every third word a lie. Do were paid to the hearer than the Turk's tribute. I do remember him at Clement's Inn like a man made after supper of a cheese pairing. When he was naked, he was for all the world like a forked radish with a head fantastically carved upon it with a knife. <laughs> he was so forlorn that his dimensions to any fixed sight were invincible. He was the very genius of famine, yet lecherous as a monk here. <laughs> and the horse called a mandrake <laughs> he came ever in the rearward of the fashion and sung those tunes to the oversketched huff's wives that he heard the carmen whistle and swore they were his fancies or his good nights and now is this vice's dagger become a squire and talks as familiarly of John Agant as if he'd been sworn brother to him. And I'll be sworn he ne'er saw him but once in the tilt yard, and then he burst his head for crowding among the marshal's men. I saw him and told John Agant he beat his own name, for you might have thrust him and all his apparel into an eel skin. <laughs> <laughs> the case of a treble obol was a mansion for him, a court. And now has he land and beefs. Well, I'll be acquainted with him if I return, and it shall go hard, but I will make him a philosopher's two stones to me. If the young days be a bait for the old pike, I see no reason in the law of nature, but I may snap at him. <laughs> Let time shape. Hmm? And there an end.
one. What is this forest called? It is Gort Tree Forest, and shall please your grace. Here stand, my lords, and send discoverers forth to know the numbers of our enemies. We have sent forth already. It is well done. My friends and brethren in these great affairs, I must acquaint you that I have received new dated letters from Northumberland. Their cold intent, tenor and substance thus. Here doth he wish his person with such powers as might hold sortance with his quality the which he could not levy, whereupon he is retired to ripe his growing fortunes to Scotland and concludes in hearty prayers that your attempts may overlive the hazard and fearful melting of their opposite. Thus do the, do the hopes we have in him touch ground and dash themselves to pieces. Well, now what's the news? West of this forest, scarcely off a mile, in goodly form comes on the enemy, and by the ground they hide, I judge their number upon or near the rate of 30,000. Uh, the just proportion that we gave them out. <laughs> Let us sway on and face them in the field. What well-appointed leader fronts us here? I think it is my Lord of Westmoreland. Health and fair greeting from our general, the Prince, Lord John and Duke of Lancaster. Stay on, my Lord of Westmoreland, in peace. What doth concern your coming? Then, my Lord, unto your grace do I in chief address the substance of my speech. If that rebellion came like itself in base and abject routs, uh, led on by bloody youth, guarded with rage and countenanced by boys and beggary. I say, if damned commotion so appeared in his true, native and most proper shape, you, reverend father, and these noble lords had not been here to dress the ugly form of base and bloody insurrection with your fair honours. You... Lord Archbishop, whose sea is by a civil peace maintained, whose beard the silver hand of peace hath touched, whose learning and good letters peace hath tutored, whose white investments figure innocence, the dove and very blessed spirit of peace. Wherefore do you so ill translate yourself out of, out of the speech of peace that bears such grace? into the harsh and boisterous tongue of war. Turning your books to graves, your ink to blood, your pens to lances, and your tongue divine to a trumpet and a point of war? Wherefore do I this? So the question stands. Briefly, to this end. We are all diseased, and with our surfeiting and wanton hours have brought ourselves into a burning fever, and we must bleed for it. With which disease our late king, Richard, being infected, died. But, my most noble lord of Westmoreland, I take not on me here as a physician, nor do I as an enemy to peace troop in the throngs of military men, but rather show a while like fearful war to diet rank minds of sickness and purge the obstructions which begin to stop our very veins of life hear me more plainly i have in equal balance justly weighed what wrongs our arms may do what wrongs we suffer and find our griefs heavier than our offenses we see which way the stream of time doth run and are enforced from our most quiet there by the rough torrent of occasion, and have the summary of all our griefs when time shall serve to show in articles, which long ere this we've offered to the king and might by no suit gain our audience. When we are wronged and would unfold our griefs, we are denied access unto his person, even by those men that most have done us wrong. 
dangers of the days, but newly gone, whose memory is written on the earth with yet appearing blood, and the examples of every minute's instance, present now, hath put us in these ill-beseeming arms, not to break peace or any branch of it, but to establish here a peace indeed, concurring both in name and quality. Whenever yet was your appeal denied? Wherein have you been galled by the king? What peer hath been suborned to grate on you that you should seal this lawless, bloody book of forged rebellion with a seal divine and consecrate commotion's bitter edge? My brother general, the commonwealth, the brother born, and household cruelty, I make my quarrel in particular. There is no need of any such redress, or if there were, it not belongs to you. Why not to him in part? And to us all that feel the bruises of the days before and suffer the condition of these times to lay a heavy and unequal hand upon our honours. Ah, uh, my good Lord Mowbray. Construe the times to their necessities, and you shall say indeed it is the time, and not the king, that doth your injuries. Yet for your part it not appears to me, either from the king or in the present time, that you should have an inch of any ground to build a grief on. Were you not restored to all the Duke of Norfolk's signories, your noble and right well-remembered fathers? What thing in honour had my father lost that need to be revived and breathed in me? The king that loved him, as the state stood then, was force for force compelled to banish him. And then that Harry Bolingbroke and he, being mounted, and both roused in their seats, their neighing courses, daring of the spur, their armoured staves in charge, their beavers down, their eyes of fire, sparkling through sights of steel, and the loud trumpet blowing them together. Then, then when there was nothing could have stayed my father from the breast of Bolingbroke, oh, when the king did throw his warder down, his own life hung upon the staff he threw, then threw down himself and all their lives that by indictment and by dint of sword have since miscarried under Bolingbroke. You speak, Lord Mowbray, now you know not what. The Earl of Hereford was reputed then in England the most valiant gentleman. Who knows on whom fortune would then have smiled? But if your father had been the victor there, he ne'er had borne it out of Coventry, for all the country in a general voice cried hate upon him, and all their prayers and love were set on Hereford, whom they doted on and blessed and graced indeed more than the king. But this is mere digression from my purpose, here come I from our princely general to know your griefs, to tell you from his grace that he will give you audience, and wherein it shall appear that your demands are just, you shall enjoy them. Everything set off that might so much as think you enemies. But he hath forced us to compel this offer, and it proceeds from policy, not from love. Mowbray, you overween to take it so. This offer comes from mercy, not from fear. For lo, within a ken of our army lies. Upon mine honour, all too confident to give admittance to a thought of fear. Our battle is more full of names than yours. Our men more perfect in the use of arms. Our armour all as strong, our cause the best. Then reason well our heart should be as good. Say you not then our offer is compelled? Well, by my will we shall admit no parley. That argues but the shame of your offence. A rotten case abides no handling. 
Hath the Prince John a full commission, in very ample virtue of his father, to hear and absolutely to determine of what conditions we shall stand upon? That is intended in the general's name. I muse you make so slight a question. Then take, my Duke of Westmoreland, this schedule. For it contains our general grievances. Each several article herein redressed, all members of our cause, both here and hence, that are insinued to this action, acquitted by a true substantial form and present execution of our wills to us and to our purposes confined, we will come within our awful banks again and knit our powers to the arm of peace. This will I show the general. Please you lords, in sight of both our battles we may meet and either end in peace, which God so frame, or to the place of difference, call the swords which must decide it. My lord, we will do so. Oh, there's a thing within my bosom tells me that no conditions of our peace can stand. Fear you not that. If we can make our peace upon such large terms and so absolute as our conditions shall consist upon, our peace shall stand as firm as rocky mountains. Yea, but our valuation, valuation shall be such that every slight and every false derived cause, yea, every idle, nice and wanton reason shall to the king taste of this action, that were our royal faiths martyrs in love, we shall be winnowed with so rough a wind that even our corn shall seem as light as chaff, and good from bad find no partition. No, no, my lord. Note this. The king is weary of such picking grievances, for he hath found to end one without by death revives two greater in the heirs of life, and therefore will he wipe his tables clean and keep no telltale to his memory that may repeat in history his loss to new remembrance. For full well he knows he cannot so precisely weed this land as his misdoubts present occasion. His foes are so enrooted with his friends that plucking to unfix an enemy he doth unfasten so and shake a friend. So that this land like an offensive wife that hath enraged him on to offer strokes, as he is striking, holds his infant up and hangs resolved correction in the arm that was upreared to execution. Besides, the king hath wasted all his rods on late offenders, that he now doth lack the very instruments of chastisement, so that his power like to a fangless lion, may offer, but not hold. It's very true. And therefore be assured, my good Lord Marshal, if we do now make our atonement well, our peace will, like a broken wind united, grow stronger for the breaking. Be it so. <laughs> Here is returned my Lord of Westmoreland. The prince is here at hand. Pleaseth your lordship to meet his grace just distance between our armies. Your grace of York, in God's name, then set forth. Before and greet his grace, my lord, we come. You are well encountered here, my cousin Mowbray. Good day to you, gentle lord archbishop, and so to you, Lord Hastings, and to all. My Lord of York, it better showed with you when that your flock, assembled by the bell, encircled you to hear with reverence your exposition on the holy text, than now to see you hear an iron man cheering a rout of rebels with your drum, turning the word to sword and life to death. That man that sits within a monarch's heart and ripens in the sunshine of his favour, would he abuse the countenance of the king? Alack, what mischiefs might he set a broach and shadow of such greatness? With you, Lord Bishop, it is even so. Who hath not heard it spoken how deep you were within the books of God, 
to us, the speaker in his parliament, to us, the imagined voice of God himself, the very opener and intelligence there between the grace, the sanctities of heaven and our dull workings. Ah, oh, who shall believe but you misuse the reverence of your place, employ the countenance and grace of heaven as a false favorite doth his prince's name in deeds dishonorable. You have taken up under the counterfeited zeal of God, the subjects of his substitute, my father, and both against the peace of heaven and him have he upswarmed them. Good my lord of Lancaster, I am not here against your father's peace, but as I told my lord of Westmoreland, the time misordered doth in common sense crowd and crush us to this monstrous form to hold our safety up. I sent your grace the parcels and particulars of our grief, which hath been with scorn shoved from the court, whereon this Hydra son of war is born, whose dangerous eyes may well be charmed asleep with grant of our most just and right desires. And true obedience of this madness cured, stoop tamely at the foot of majesty. If not, we ready are to try our fortunes to the last man. And though we here fall down, we have supplies to second our attempt. If they miscarry, theirs shall second them, and so success of mischief shall be born. And heir from heir shall hold this quarrel up, whilst England shall have generation. You are too shallow, Hastings, much too shallow to stand the bottom of the aftertimes. Where it pleaseth your grace to answer them directly, how far forth you do like their articles. I like them all and do allow them well and sway here by the honour of my blood. My father's purposes have been mistook and some about him have too lavishly wrested his meaning and authority. My lord, these griefs shall be with speed redressed. Upon my soul they shall. If this may please you, discharge your powers unto their several counties as will ours, and here between these armies, let's drink together friendly and embrace that all their eyes may bear these tokens home of our restored love and amity. I take your princely word for these redresses. I give it you and will maintain my word. And thereupon, I drink unto your grace. Go, Captain, and deliver to the army this news of peace. Let them have pay and part. I know it will well please them. Hi thee, Captain. To you, my noble Lord of Westmoreland. I pledge your grace. And if you knew what pains I have bestowed to breed this present peace, you would drink freely. But my love to you shall show itself more openly hereafter. I do not doubt you. I'm glad of it. Uh, health to my Lord and gentle cousin Mowbray. You wish me health in a very happy season, for I am on a sudden something ill. Against ill chances men are ever merry, but heaviness foreruns the good event. Therefore be merry, cuz, since sudden sorrow serves to say thus, some good thing comes tomorrow. <laughs> Believe me, I am passing light of spirit. Mm, so much the worse if your own rule be true. Peace is rendered. Oh, how they shout. <laughs> the word of peace is rendered. Hark how they shout. <laughs> this had been cheerful after victory. A peace is of the nature of a conquest, for then both parties nobly are subdued and neither party. Go, my lord, and let our army be discharged too. And good, my lord, so please you, let our trains march by us that we may peruse the men we should have coped withal. Go, good lord Hastings, and ere they be dismissed, let them march by. I trust, lords, we shall lie tonight together. Now, cousin, wherefore stands our army still? Uh, the leaders, having a charge from you to stand, will not go off until they hear you speak. 
They know their duties. My Lord, our army is dispersed already. Like youthful steers unyoked, they take their courses east, west, north, south, or like a school broke up, each hurries toward his home and sporting place. Good tidings, my Lord Hastings. For the which I do arrest thee, traitor of high treason, and you, Lord Archbishop, and you, Lord Mowbray, of capital treason, I attach you both. Is this proceeding ju just and honourable? Is your assembly so? Will you thus break your faith? I pawn thee none. I promise you redress of these same grievances, whereof you did complain, which by mine honour I will perform with a most Christian care. Mm. But for you, rebels, look to taste the due meat for rebellion and such act as yours. Most shallowly did you these arms commence, fondly brought here and foolishly sent hence. Strike up our drums, pursue the scattered stray. God and not we hath safely fought today. Some guard these traitors to the block of death, treason's true bread fed and yielder up of breath. What's your name, sir? Of what condition are you, and of what place, I pray? I am a knight, sir, and my name is Colville of the Dale. Well, then, Colville is your name. A knight is your degree, and your place, the Dale. Colville sh I think you are, Sir John Falstaff, and in that thought, yield me. <laughs> I have a whole school of tongues in this belly of mine, and not a tongue of them all speaks any other word but my name. <laughs> and I had but a belly of any indifference. I was simply the most active fellow in Europe. My womb. My womb. My womb. Undoes me. Oh! Here comes our general. The heat is past, follow no further now. Call in the powers, good cousin Westmoreland. Now, Falstaff, where have you been all this while? When everything is ended, then you come. These tardy tricks of yours will on my life one time or another break some gallows back. I would be sorry, my lord, but it should be thus. I never knew yet, but rebuke and check was the reward of valor. Do you think me a swallow, an arrow, or a bullet? Have I, in my poor and old motion, the expedition of thought? I have speeded me hither with the very extremest inch of possibility. I have founded nine score and odd posts, and here, travel tainted as I am, have in my pure and immaculate valor taken Sir John Colville of the Dale, a most furious knight and valorous enemy. But what of that? He saw me and yielded, that I may justly say with the hook-nosed fellow of Rome, I came, saw, and overcame. It was more of his courtesy than your deserving. I know not. Here he is, and here I yield him. And I beseech your grace, let it be booked with the rest of this day's deeds, or by the Lord I will have it in a particular ballad else, with mine own picture on the top on it. Colville, kissing my foot, to the which course if I be enforced, if you do not all show like guilt tuppences to me, and I in the clear sky of fame, or shine you as much as the full moon doth the cinders of the element, which show like pins heads to her, believe not the word of the noble. Therefore, let me have right, and let desert mount. Nine's too heavy to mount. 
Let it shine then. Nine's too thick to shine. Let it do something, my good lord, that may do me good and call it what you will. Is thy name Colville? It is, my lord. A famous rebel art thou, Colville. And a famous true subject took him. I am, my lord, but as my betters are, but led me hither. Had they been ruled by me, you should have won them dearer than you have. I know not how they sold themselves, but thou, like a kind fellow, gavest thyself away gratis, and I thank thee for thee. Now, have you left pursuit? Retreat is made, and execution stayed. Send Colville with his confederates to York to present execution. Blunt, lead him hence and see you guard him sure. And now dispatch we towards the court, my lords. I hear the king my father is sore sick. Our news shall go before us to his majesty, which, cousin, you shall bear to comfort him, and we with service speed will follow you. My lord, I beseech you, give me leave to go through Gloucestershire, and when you come to court, stand my good lord pray in your good report. Fare you well, Falstaff. I, in my conditions, now speak better of you than you deserve. I would you had but the wit. To a better than your dukedom. Good faith. This same young sober-blooded boy doth not love me, nor a man cannot make him laugh. <laughs> but that's no marvel. He drinks no wine. There's never none of these demure boys come to any proof, for thin drink doth so overcool their blood, and making many fish meals, that they fall into a kind of male green sickness. And then when they marry, they get wenches! They are generally fools and cowards, which some of us should be too, but for inflammation. <laughs> a good sheriff's sack hath a twofold operation in it. It ascends me into the brain, drives me there all the foolish and dull and uh, curdy vapors which environ it, makes it apprehensive, quick, um, forgetive, uh, full of nimble, fiery, and delectable shapes which, delivered o'er to the voice, the tongue, which is the birth, becomes excellent wit. The second property of your excellent Sheris is the warming of the blood which before, cold and settled, left the liver white and pale, which is the badge of pusillanimity and cowardice. But the Sheris warms it and makes it coarse from the innards to the parts extreme. It illumineth the face, which as a beacon gives warning to all the rest of this little kingdom, man, the face, <laughs> to arm, and then the vital commoners and inland petty spirits muster me all to their captain, the heart, who great and puffed up with this retinue doth any deed of courage, and this valor comes of <laughs> Oh, So that skill is in the weapon is nothing without sack, for that sets it a work. And learning a mere hoard of gold kept by a devil till sack commences it and sets it in act and use. Hereof comes it that Prince Harry is valiant, for the cold blood he did naturally inherit of his father he hath, like lean, sterile, and bare land, manured, husbanded, and tilled with excellent endeavor of drinking good and good store of fertile sherry that he is become very hot and valiant. If I had a thousand sons, the first humane principle I would teach them should be to forswear thin potations and to addict themselves to sack. How now, Bardolf? The army is discharged, all and gone. Let them go. I'll through Gloucestershire, and there will I visit Master Robert Shallow, Esquire. I have him already tampering between my finger and my thumb, and shortly will I seal with him. <laughs> uh, come away.
Now, Lords, if God doth give successful end to this debate that bleedeth at our doors, we will our youth lead on to higher fields and draw no swords but what are sanctified. Our navy is addressed, our power collected, our substitutes in absence well invested, and everything lies level to our wish. <laughs> Only we want a little personal strength. <laughs> and pause us till these rebels now afoot come underneath the yoke of government. Oath which we doubt not, but your majesty shall soon enjoy. Humphrey, my son of Gloucester, where is the prince, uh, thy brother? I think he's gone to hunt, my lord, at Windsor. And how accompanied? I do not know, my lord. Uh, is not his brother Thomas of Clarence with him? No, my good lord, he is in presence here. What would my lord and father? Ah. Nothing but well to thee, Thomas of Clarence. How chance thou art not with the prince thy brother? He loves thee, and dost, thou dost neglect him. Thomas, thou hast a better place in his affection than all thy brothers. Cherish it, my boy, and noble offices thou mayest effect on mediation after I am dead. Between his greatness and thy other brethren. Therefore, omit him not, blunt not his love, nor lose the good advantage of his grace by seeming cold or careless of his will. For he is gracious, if he be observed. <clears throat> he hath a tear for pity, and a hand as open as day for melting charity. Yet notwithstanding, being incensed, he is flint as humorous as winter, and as sudden as flaws congeal it in the spring of day. <coughs> His temper, therefore, must be well observed. You chide him for his faults, but do it reverently, where thou perceive his blood inclined to mirth. But being moody, give him line and scope till his passions, like a whale on the ground confound themselves with work. <laughs> you learn this. Thomas, thou shalt prove a shelter to thy friends, a hoop of gold to bind thy brothers in, that the united vessel of their blood mingled with the venom of suggestion as force perforce the age will pour it in, shall never leak though it do work as strong as aconitum and rash gunpowder. I shall observe him with all the care and love. Lord. So why art thou not at Windsor with him, Thomas? He is not there today. He dines in London. And how accompanied? Canst thou tell me that? With points and other his continual subjects. Most subject is the fattest soil to weeds, and he, the noble image of my youth, is o'erspread with them. Therefore my grief stretches itself beyond the hour of death. The blood weeps from my heart when I do shape and forms imaginary the unguided days and rotten times that you shall look upon when I am sleeping with them, my ancestors. For when his headstrong riot hath no curb, when rage and hot blood are his counselors, when means and lavish manners meet together, <laughs> with what wings shall his affections fly towards fronting peril and opposed decay? My gracious Lord, you look beyond him quite, the prince but studies his companions like a strange tongue, wherein to gain the language tis needful that the most immodest word be looked upon and learned, which once attained, your highness knows, comes to no further use but to be known and hated. 
So like gross terms, the prince will in the perfectness of time cast off his followers and their memory shall as a pattern or a measure live by which his grace must meet the lives of others, turning past evils to advantages. Uh, it is seldom when the bee doth leave her comb in the dead carrion. Who's here? Oh, Westmoreland! <laughs> oh, health to my sovereign, and new happiness added to that that I am to deliver. Prince John, your son, doth kiss your grace's hand. Mm. Mowbray, the bishop's scroop, Hastings and all are brought to the correction of your law. <laughs> there is not now a rebel sword unsheathed, but peace puts forth her olive everywhere. <laughs> the manner in how this action hath been born here at more leisure, may your highness read with every course in his particular. Oh, was more than now on a summer bird, which ever in the haunch of winter sings the uplifting of the day. Oh, look, here's more news. From enemies heaven, keep your majesty, and when they stand against you, may they fall, as those that I am come to tell you of, the Earl Northumberland and the Lord Bardolph, with the great power of English and of Scots, are by the Sheriff of Yorkshire overthrown. The manner and who ordered the fight, this packet, please it you contains at large. Wherefore should these good news make me sick? Ah, well, fortune never come with both hands full, but write a fair word still in foulest letters. She either gives a stomach and no food, such as the poor and wealth, or else a feast and takes away the stomach, such are the rich. And have abundance and enjoy it not i should rejoice now but at this happy news and now my sight fails my brain is giddy oh come near me now well i am i am much ill comfort your majesty oh my royal father my sovereign lord, cheer up yourself. Look up. You do know these fits are with his highness very ordinary. Stand from him. Give him air. He'll straight be well. No, no, no. He cannot long hold out these pangs. The incessant care and labour of his mind hath wrought the neuro that should confine it in so that life looks through and, and will break out. The people fear me. For they do observe unfathered heirs and lowly births of nature. The seasons change their manners as the year had found some months asleep and leaped them over. The river hath thrice flowed, no ebb between. And the old folk times doting chronicles say it did so little time before that our great grandsires Edward sicked and died. Speak lower, princes, for the king recovers. This apoplexy will certainly be his end. I pray you, take me up and bear me hence into some other chamber. Softly pray. Let there be no noise made, my gentle friends, and lest some dull and favorable hand will whisper music to my weary spirit. Call for uh, music in the other room. Set me the crown upon my pillow. Yeah. His eye is hollow and he changes much. Less noise, less noise. Who saw the Duke of Clarence? I'm here, brother, full of heaviness. How now? Rain within doors and none abroad? How doth the king? Exceeding ill. Heard he the good news yet? Tell it him. He altered much upon the hearing it. Oh, if he be sick with joy, well, he'll recover without physic. Not so much noise, my lords. Sweet prince, speak low. Your, the king, your father, is disposed to sleep. Let us withdraw to the other room. Will it please your grace to go along with us? No. I will sit and watch here by the king.
Why does the crown lie there upon his pillow, being so troublesome a bedfellow? Oh, polished perturbation. Golden care that keeps the ports of slumber open wide to many a watchful night. Sleep with it now. Yet not so sound and half so deeply sweet as he whose brows with homely big and bound snores out the watch of night. O oh, majesty, when thou dost pinch thy bearer, thou dost sit like a rich armor worn in heat of day that scalds with safety. By his gates of breath there lies a downy feather which stirs not. Did he suspire the light and weightless down perforce must move? My gracious Lord, My father, this sleep is sound indeed. This is a sleep that from this golden regal hath divorced so many English kings. Thy due from me is tears and heavy sorrows of the blood, which nature, love, and filial tenderness shall, O oh dear father, pay thee plenteously. My due from thee is this imperial crown, which, as immediate as thy place and blood, derives itself to me. Oh, lo where it sits, which God shall guard, and put the whole world's strength into one giant arm. It shall not force this lineal honor from me. This from thee will I to mine leave. as tis left to me. Warwick. Gloucester. Clarence. Doth the king call? Why what did you... Your How fares your grace? Why did you leave me here alone, my lords? We, we let the prince, my brother, here, my liege. She undertook to sit and watch by you. The prince of Wales, where is he? Let me see him. This I, door is open. Not here. This door is open. He is gone this way. He came not through the chamber where we stayed. What is a crown? Who took it from my pillow? When we withdrew, my liege, we left it here. The prince hath taken it. Go seek him out. He's so hasty that suppose my sleep, my death. Find him, my lord of war, and chide him hither. Oh, this part of his conjoins with my disease and helps to end me. You see, sons, what things you are? How quickly nature falls into revolt when gold becomes her object. For this, the foolish, over-careful fathers have broke their sleep with thoughts, their brains with care, their bones with industry. For this, they have engrossed and piled up the cankered heaps of strange, achieved gold. For this, they have been thoughtful to invest their sons with arts and martial exercises, when like the bee toiling from every flower, the virtuous sweets are thighs packed with wax, our mouths with honey, we bring it to the hive, and like the bees are murdered for our pains. This bitter taste yield is engrossments to the ending father. Now where is he? It will not stay so long till his friend's sickness hath determined me. My lord, I found the prince in the next room, washing with kindly tears his gentle cheeks, with such a deep demeanor in great sorrow that tyranny, which never quaffed but blood, would, by beholding him, have washed his knife with gentle eye drops. He is coming hither. But wherefore did he take away the crown? Hello, here he comes. Come hither to me, Harry. Depart the chamber, leave us here alone. 
I never thought to hear you speak again. Thy wish was thy father, Harry, to that thought. Would I stay too long by thee? But I weary thee? Dost thou hunger for my empty chair? That thou wilt needs invest thee with my honors before thy hour is ripe? <laughs> Foolish youth, thou seekst the greatness that will overwhelm thee. Would you stay but a little? When my cloud of dignity is held from falling with so weak a wind that it will quickly drop. My day is dim. Thou hast stolen that which after some few hours were thine without offense, and at my death thou hast sealed up my expectation. My life did manifest thou lovest me not, and thou wilt have me die assured of it. Thou highest a thousand daggers in thy thoughts, which thou hast wetted on thy stony heart, it has stabbed me a half an hour of my life, what, canst thou not forbear me a half an hour? Well, then get thee gone, dig my grave my, thyself, and bid the merry bells ring to thine ear, that thou art crowned, not that I am dead. Let all tears that should bedew my hers be drops of balm to sanctify thy head. Only compound me with forgotten dust. Give that which gave thee life unto the worms. They pluck down my officers and break my decrees. For now a time has come to mock at form. Harry V is crowned. Up, vanity, down, royal state. All you sage counselors hence, and to the English court assembled now from every region, apes of idleness, now, Neighbor confines, purge you of your scum. Have you a ruffian that will swear, drink, dance, revel at night, rob, murder, and commit the oldest sins in the newest kinds of ways? Be happy. He will trouble you no more. England shall double gild his treble guilt. England shall give him office, honor, might, for the fifth Harry from curbed license plucks, the muzzle of restraint, and the wild dog shall flesh his tooth on every innocent. Oh, my poor kingdom. Sick with civil blows, when that my care could not withhold thy riots, what wilt thou do when thy riot is thy care? Oh, thou wilt be a wilderness again, peopled with wolves and old inhabitants. Oh, pardon me, my leash. But for my tears, the moist impediments unto my speech, I had forestalled this dear and deep rebuke. Ere you with grief had spoken, I had heard the cause of it so far. There is your crown. And he that wears it immortally, long may he guard it yours. If I affect it more than your honor and as your renown, let me no more from this obedience rise, which my most inward, true, and duteous spirit teacheth this prostrate and exterior bending. God witness with me. When I here came in and found no course of breath within your majesty, how cold it struck my heart. If I do feign, Oh, let me in my present wildness die and never live to show the incredulous world the noble change that I have purposed. Coming to look on you, thinking you dead and dead almost my liege to think you were. I spake unto this crown as having sent and thus upbraided it. The care on thee depending hath fed upon the body of my father. Therefore, thou best of gold art worst of gold. Other, less fine in carrot, is more precious, preserving life in medicine potable. But thou, most 
fine, most honoured, most renowned, has eat thy bearer up. Thus, my most royal liege, accusing it, I put it on my head, to try with it, as with an enemy that had before my face murdered my father, the quarrel of a true inheritor. But if it did infect my blood with joy, or swell my thoughts to any strain of pride, if any rebel or vain spirit of mine did with the least affection of a welcome give entertainment to the might of it, oh, let God forever keep it from my head and make me as the poorest vassal is that doth with awe and terror kneel to it. Oh, my son. <laughs> God, put it in thy mind to take it hence, that thou mightst win the more thy father's love, pleading so wisely in excuse of it. Come hither, hey, sit thou by my bed. And here I think the very latest counsel that ever I shall breathe. God knows, my son. What bypaths and indirect crooked ways I met this crown. I myself know well how troublesome it sat on my head. But to thee, it shall descend with better quiet, better opinion, better confirmation for all the soil of the achievement goes with me into the earth. It seemed in me, but as an honor snatched with boisterous hand, and I had many living to upbraid my gain of it with by their assistances, which daily grew to quarrel and bloodshed, wounding supposed peace. All these bold fears thou seest with peril, I have answered, for all my reign hath been but as a scene, acting that argument. And now my death changes that mode. For what in me was purchased falls upon thee in a more fairer sort. So thou, the garland, wears successively. Yet though thou standest more sure than I could do, thou art not firm enough since griefs and green on all, all, all my friends, which thou must make thy friends have but their strings and teeth newly taken out, by whose fell working I was first advanced, and by whose power I well might lodge a feared to be again displaced, which to avoid I cut them off, and had a purpose now to lead out many to the holy land. Let rest and lying still might make them look too near unto my state, therefore my hairy be at thy course, to busy, giddy minds with foreign quarrels. That action, hence borne out, may waste the memory of the former days. And more would I, but my lungs are wasted so that strength of speech is utterly denied me. How I came by the crown, O oh God, forgive, and grant it may with thee in true peace live. My gracious liege, you won it, wore it, kept it, gave it me, then plain and right must my possession be, which I with more than with a common pain against all the world will rightfully maintain. Oh, look, look, here comes my John of Lancaster. <laughs> Health, haste, and happiness to my royal father. Well, thou brings me happiness and peace, son John, but health 
alike with youthful wings is flown from this barren withered trunk. <laughs> Upon thy sight, my worldly business makes a period. Where is my Lord of Warwick? My Lord of Warwick. Doth any name particular belong unto the lodging where I first did swoon? Tis called Jerusalem, my noble lord. <laughs> Lord be to God. Even there my life must end. It hath been prophesied to me many years I should not die but in Jerusalem, which vainly I suppose to be the Holy Land. But bear me to that chamber. There I lie. In that Jerusalem shall Harry die. By cock and pie, sir, you shall not away tonight. What? Davy, I say. You must excuse me, Master Robert Tello. I will not excuse you. You shall not be excused. Excuses shall not be admitted. There is no excuse shall serve. You shall not be excused. By Davy. Here, sir. Davy. Davy, 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 Davy. Let me see, Davy. Let me see, Davy. Let me see. Yea, Mary. William Cook, bid him come hither. Uh, Sir John, you shall not be excused. <laughs> Mary, sir, thus these precepts cannot be served. And again, sir, uh, shall we sow the headland with wheat? Oh, uh, with uh, red wheat, Davy. But for William Cook, are there no young pigeons? Oh, yes, sir. Um, here is now the smith's note for shoeing and plough irons. Oh, well, well, let it be cast and paid. Uh, Sir John, you shall not be excused. Oh, now, sir, a new link to the bucket must be had. And, sir, do you mean to stop any of William's wages about the sack he lost the other day at the Hinkley Fair? I shall answer it. Some pigeons, Davy, a couple of short-legged hens, a joint of mutton, and any pretty little tiny kickshaws. Tell William Cook. Doth a man of war stay all night, sir? Uh, yea, Davy. I will use him well. A friend in the court is better than a penny in purse. Eh? Use his men well, Davy, for they are errant knaves and will backbite. <laughs> no worse than they are backbiters, sir, for they have marvellous foul linen. <laughs> oh, well conceited, Davy. Uh, about that business, Davy. Go, go, go. I beseech you, sir, to countenance uh, William Visser of Wancourt against Clement Perks of the Hill. There is many complaints, Davy, against that visitor. That visitor is an arrant knave, on my knowledge. Well, I grant your worship that he is a knave, sir. But yet, God forbid, sir, but a knave should have some countenance at his friend's request. An honest man, sir, able to speak for himself when a knave is not. Uh, for I have served your worship truly, and for this eight years, am I cannot once or twice in a quarter bear out a knave against all honest men? I have but very little credit with you, your worship. The knave is mine, honest friend, sir. Therefore, I beseech your worship, let him be countenanced. Oh, go to, I say he shall have no wrong. Now look about, Davy. Uh, where are you, Sir John? Come, 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 come. Up with your boots. <laughs> Give me your hand, Master Bardolf. I'm glad to see you, Your Worship. 
I thank thee with all my heart, kind Master Bardo, and welcome, my tall fellow. <laughs> Come, Sir John. I'll follow you, good Master Robert Shallow. Bardolf, look to our horses. If I were sawed into quantities, I should make four dozen of such bearded hermit staves as Master Shallow. Oh, it is a wonderful thing to see the semblable coherence of his men's spirits and his. They, by observing of him, do forbear themselves like foolish justices. He, by conversing with them, is turned into a justice-like servingman. Their spirits are so married in conjunction with the participation of society that they flock together in consent like so many wild geese. If I had a suit to Master Shallow, I would humor his men with the imputation of being near their master. If to his men, I would curry with Master Shallow that no man could better command his servants. It is certain that either wise bearing or ignorant carriage is caught as men take diseases one of another. Therefore, let men take heed of their company. I will devise matter enough out of this shallow to keep Prince Harry in continual loft <laughs> wearing out of six fashions, which is uh, four terms or two actions, and he shall laugh without intervallums. Oh, it is much that a lie with a slight oath and a jest with a sad brow will do with a fellow that never had the ache in his shoulders. Oh, you shall see him laugh till his face be like a wet cloak, ill laid up. Sir John! I come, Master Shallow! <laughs> I come, Master Shallow. <laughs> How now, my Lord Chief Justice, wither away? And as the King. Exceeding well, his cares are now all ended. I hope not dead. He's walked the way of nature, and to our purposes, he lives no more. I would his majesty had called me with him. The service that I truly did his life hath left me open to all injuries. Indeed. I think the young king loves you not. I know he does not, and do arm myself to welcome the condition of the time which cannot look more hideously upon me than I have drawn it in my fantasy. Ah, here come the heavy issue of dead Harry. Oh, that the living Harry had the temper of he, the worst of these three gentlemen, how many nobles then should hold their places that must strike sail to the spirits of a vile sword? God, I fear all will be overturned. Good morrow, cousin Warwick. Good morrow. Good, Good morrow, morrow, cousin. cousin. Good morrow. Good morrow. <clears throat> we meet like men that had forgot to speak. <laughs> <laughs> We do remember, but our argument is all too heavy to admit much talk. <laughs> well, peace be with him that hath made us heavy. Peace be with us, lest we be heavier. Oh, good my lord, you have lost a friend indeed, and I dare swear you borrow not that face of seeming sorrow. It is sure your own. Though no man be assured what grace to find, you stand in coldest expectation. I am the sorrier, would twere otherwise. You must now speak Sir John Falstaff fair, which swims against your stream of quality. Sweet princess, what I did, I did in honour, led by the impartial conduct of my soul, and never shall you see that I will beg a ragged and forestalled remission. If truth and upright innocency fail me, I'll to the king my master that is dead, and tell him who hath sent me after him. 
Here comes the prince. Good morrow, and God save your majesty. New and gorgeous garment majesty sits not so easy on me as you think. <laughs> Brothers, you mix your sadness with some fear. This is the English, not the Turkish court. Not Amarath and Amarath succeed, but Harry, Harry. <clears throat> Yet be sad, good brothers, for by my faith it very well becomes you. Sorrow so royally in you appears that I will deeply put the fashion on and wear it in my heart. Why then, <clears throat> be sad, but entertain no more of it, good brothers, than a joint burden laid upon us all. For me, by heaven, I bid you be assured I'll be your father and, and your brother too. Let me but bear your love, I'll bear your cares. Yet weep that Harry's dead and so will I. But Harry lives that shall convert those tears by number into hours of happiness. We hope no, we otherwise. Hope no other from your majesty. Your majesty. all look strangely on me <laughs> and you most you are i think assured i love you not i am assured if i be measured rightly your majesty hath no just cause to hate me no how now might a prince of my great hopes forget so great indignities you laid upon me what rate rebuke and roughly send to prison the immediate heir of england hmm? Was this easy? May this be washed in lead and forgotten. I then did use the person of your father. The image of his power lay then in me and in the administration of his law. Whilst I was busy for the Commonwealth, your Highness pleased to forget my place, the majesty and power of law and justice, the image of the king whom I presented and struck me in my very seat of judgment, whereon as an offender, to your father, I gave bold way to my authority and did commit you. If the deed were ill, be you contented, wearing now the garland, to have a son set your decrees at naught, to pluck down justice from your awful bench, to trip the course of law and blunt the sword that guards the peace and safety of your person. Nay more, to spurn at your most royal image and mock your workings in a second body. Question your royal thoughts. Make the case yours. Be now the father and propose a son. Hear your own dignity so much profaned. See your most dreadful laws so loosely slighted. Behold yourself so by a son disdained. And then imagine me taking your part and in your power soft silencing your son. After this cold considerance, sentence me, and as you are a king, speak in your state what I have done that misbecame my place, my person, or my liege's sovereignty. You are right, Justice, and you weigh this well. Therefore, still bear the balance and the sword. And I do wish your honours may increase. <sighs> Till you do live to see a son of mine offend you and obey you as I did. So shall I live to speak my father's words. Happy am I that have a man so bold that dares do justice on my proper son, and not less happy having such a son that would deliver up his greatness so into the hands of justice. You did commit me, for which I do commit into your hand the unstained sword that you have used to bear with this remembrance, that you use the same with the like bold, just and impartial spirit as you have done against me. This is my hand. You shall be father as to my youth. My, my voice shall sound as you do prompt mine ear and I will stoop and humble my intents to your well-practiced wise direction. And princes all, believe me, I beseech you, my father is gone wild into his grave. For in his tomb lie my affections, and with his spirit sadly 
I survive to mock the expectation of the world, to frustrate prophecies and to raise out rotten opinion who hath written me down after my seeming. The tide of blood in me hath proudly flowed in vanity till now. Now doth it turn and ebb back to the sea, where it shall mingle with the state of floods and flow henceforth in formal majesty. Now call we our high court of parliament, and let us choose such limbs of noble council that the great body of our state may go in equal rank with the best governed nation. That war or peace or both at once may be as things acquainted and familiar to us. In which you, Father, shall have foremost hand. Our coronation done, we will accite, as I before remembered, all our state. And God consigning to my good intents, no prince nor peer shall have just cause to say, God shorten Harry's happy life one day. Nay, you shall see my orchard where in an arbor we will eat a last year's pippin of my own graffing with a dish of caraways and, and so forth. Come, cousin, silence, and then to bed. Oh, God, you have here a goodly dwelling and a rich. Oh, baron, 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 beggars all, beggars all, Sir John. <laughs> Very good air. <laughs> spread, Davy, spread, Davy. Well said, Davy. This Davy serves you for good uses. He's your serving man and your husband. <laughs> A good valet, a good valet, a very good valet, Sir John. By the mess, <laughs> I have drunk too much sack at supper. <laughs> a good valet. And now sit down, now sit down. Come, cousin. Do nothing but eat and make good cheer. And <laughs> may it's got for the merrier when flesh is cheap and females dear. And lost it as from here and there, so merrily and never among so merrily. There's a merry heart. Good Master Silence, I'll give you a health for that and on. Give Master Bardolph some wine, Davy. <laughs> uh, sweet sir, uh, sit. Uh, I'll <clears throat> be with you anon. Most sweet sir, sit, sit. Uh, Master Page, good Master Page, sit, profess oh, what you want in meat, we'll have in drink, uh, but you must bear the hearts all. Be merry, Master Bardolph, <laughs> and my little soldier there, be merry. Be merry, be merry, my wife has all, for women are shoes both short and tall, as merry in hall when beards wag all, a welcome age of merry. <laughs> I, I did not think Master Silence had been a man of this metal. I? I? I, I, I have been merry twice, and, and, and once uh, now. <laughs> There's a dish of leather coats for you, sir. Davy! Your worship, I'll be with you uh, straight. Uh, a cup of wine, sir? Cup of wine, that's brisk and fine, and drink unto the lamb of mine, and the merry heart is long. Ah. Uh. <laughs> well said, Master Silence. And, and we shall be merry. Now comes in the sweet of the night. Health and long life to you, Master Silence. Fill the cup and let it come. I'll pledge you to a mile to the bottom. <laughs> Honest Bardolph, welcome. If thou wantst anything and wilt not call, beshrew thy heart. Ha, ah, ah. ha. Welcome, my little tiny thief, and welcome indeed too. I'll drink to Master Bardolph and to all the cavaliers uh, about London. <laughs> I hove to see London once ere I die. And and I might see you there, Davy. 
by the mess you crack a court together. <laughs> Will you not, Master Bardolf? Yes, sir, in a, in a pond pot. By God's ligands, I thank thee. The knave will stick by thee, I can assure thee that. I will not out, he is true bred. And I'll stick by him, sir. Why, there spoke a king. Lack nothing, be merry. Uh, look who's at the door there, ho. Who knocks? Why now, you've done me right. Do, do me right and dub me nights a mango. Oh, is, is, is it right? It's, it's just so. Uh, oh, so, well then, say, an old man can do somewhat. <laughs> Davy? I ain't please, your worship. Uh, uh, there's one pistol come from the court with news. From the court? Let him come in. How <laughs> now, pistol? <laughs> Sir John, God save you! What wind blew you here, the pistol? Oh, not the ill wind which blows no man to good. <laughs> Sweet knight, thou art now one of the greatest men in this realm. But by by a, by a lady, I, I think he be, but good man of bastard. Puff, puffing eye teeth. Most recreant coward base per <clears throat> Sir John. I am thy pistol and thy friend, and helter skelter have I rode to thee, and tidings do I bring, and lucky joys, and golden times, and happy news of price. I pray thee now deliver them like a man of this world. A future for the world and worldlings base. I speak of Africa and golden joys. Oh, base Assyrian knight, what is thy news? Let King Cophetua know the truth thereof. And Robin Hood, <laughs> Scarlet, and John. Look, shall Dunhill curs confront the Alicons, and shall good news be baffled? Then, pistol, lay thy head in fury's lap. As honest gentlemen, I, I know not your breathing. Well, why then? Lament before. Give me pardon, sir. If, sir, you come with news from the court, I take it there's but two ways. Hmm? Either to utter them or to conceal them. I am, sir, under the king in some authority. Oh, uh under which king, Bazonian, huh? Speak or die. Under King Harry. Harry the fourth or fifth? Harry the fourth. A foot of an office, Sir John. Thy tender lambkin now is king. <laughs> Harry the fifth's the man. I speak the truth when pistol lies. Do this uh, and fig me like the bragging Spaniard. <laughs> but is the old king dead? Who was nailing door? The things I speak are just. <laughs> <laughs> Away, Bardolf, sell my horse. Master Robert Shallow, choose what office thou wilt in the land. Tis thine. Oh, Pistol, <laughs> I will double charge thee with dignities. Oh. oh, joyful day. I would not take a knighthood for my fortune. What? I do bring good news. <laughs> Carry Master Silence to bed. Master Shallow, my lord Shallow, be what thou wilt. I am fortune's steward. Get on thy boots. We'll ride all night. Huh? Oh, oh, sweet pistol. <laughs> Away, Bardolf. Oh, come, pistol. Utter more to me, and withal devise something to do thyself good. Oh, boot, boot, Master Shallow. Oh, I know the young king is sick for me. Let us take, uh, uh, well, any man's horses. <laughs> All the laws of England are at thy commandment. Oh, blessed are they that have been my friends. And woe to the Lord Chief Justice. Oh, let Vulture's vile seize on his lungs also. Where is 
the life, the late eyelid, say they. <laughs> right, here it is. Welcome these pleasant days. have delivered her over to me and she shall have whipping cheer enough I warrant her there hath been a man or two lately killed about her uh, not hook not hook you lie come on I'll tell thee what thou damn it trapping bastard rascal and the child I now go do me scary thou would better thou hast struck thy mother thou paper-faced villain oh the lord that said john would come he would make this a bloody day to someone <sighs> but i pray god the fruit of her room might miscarry if it do you shall have half a dozen cushions again you have but eleven now come I charge you both, go with me, for the man is dead that you and Pistol beat amongst you. I'll tell you what, you thin man in a censor. I'll have you a soundly sweat Swedish for this, you blue bottle rug, you filthy famish correctioner. If you be not Swedish, I will forswear half curdles. Come, come, you she knight errant, come. Oh, God, that right must thus overcome might. Well, of sufferance comes ease. Come, you rog, come, bring me to justice. Ay, come, you star bloodhound. Good man, death, good man, bones. Thou, atomy, thou. Come, you thin thing. Come, you rascal. Very well. More rushes. More rushes. The trumpets have sounded twice. It will be two o'clock ere they come from the coronation. Dispatch. Dispatch. Oh, 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 oh. Stand here by me, Master Robert Shallo. I will make the king do you grace. I will leer upon him as he comes by and do but mark the countenance that he will give me. <laughs> oh, God bless thy lungs. Good night. <laughs> oh, come here, Pistol. Stand behind me. Oh, if I had had time to have made new liveries, I would have bestowed the thousand pound I borrowed of you. But this no matter. This poor show doth better. Hmm? This doth infer the zeal I had to see him. It doth so. Ah, it shows my earnestness of affection. Yeah. It doth so. My devoting. It doth, it doth, it doth. As it were to ride day and night and not to deliberate, not to remember, not to have patience to shift me. It is best certain. But to stand stained with travel and sweating with desire to see him, thinking of nothing else putting all affairs else in oblivion, as if there were nothing else to be done but to see him. Tis semper idem for obsque hoc nihil est, tis all in every part. Tis so indeed. <clears throat> My knight, I will inflame thy noble liver and make thee rage. Thy dole and Helen of thy noble thoughts is in base durance and contagious prison, hailed thither by most mechanical and dirty hand. Rouse up revenge from Eben Denon with fell electo snake, for doll is in, pistol speaks naught but truth. I will deliver her. 
Hey. Oh, hello. 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 Speak to that vain man. <laughs> Have you your wits? Know you what is to speak? My king! My Jove! I speak to thee, my heart! I know thee not, old man. Fall to thy prayers. How ill white hairs become a fool and jester. I have long dreamed of such a kind of man. So surf it swelled, so old and so profane. But being awake, I do despise my dream. Make less thy body hence, and more thy grace. Leave gormandizing. No, the grave doth gape for thee thrice wider than for other men. Reply. Not to me with a full born jest. Presume not that I am the thing I was. For God doth know, so shall the world perceive that I have turned away my former self. So will I those that kept me company. When thou dost hear, I am as I have been. Approach me, and thou shalt be as thou wast. The tutor and the feeder of my riots. Till then, I banish thee on pain of death, as I have done the rest of my misleaders, not to come near our person by 10 mile. For competence of life, I will allow you that lack of means enforce you not to evil. And as we hear you do reform yourselves, we will, according to our strengths and qualities, give you advancement. Be it your charge, my Lord, to see performed the tenor of our word. Set on. Master Shadow, I owe you a thousand pound. Yea, marry Sir John which I beseech you to let me have home with me. That can hardly be, Master Shallow. Do not you grieve at this. I shall be sent for in private to him. Look you, he must seem thus to the world. Fear not your advancements. I will be the man yet that shall make you great. I cannot well perceive how, unless you should give me your doublet and stuff me out with straw. I beseech you, good Sir John, let me have five hundred of my thousand. Sir, I will be as good as my word. This that you heard was but a color. A color I fear you will die in, Sir John. Fear no colors. Go with me to dinner. Come, Lieutenant Pistol, come, Bartoff. I shall be sent for soon, at night. Go carry Sir John Falstaff to the fleet. Take all his company along with him. My lord, my lord. I cannot now speak. I will hear you soon. Take them away. The fortuna me tormentor, sparrow me contenter. I like this fair proceeding of the kings. He hath intent his wanton followers shall be very well provided for, but all are banished till their conversations appear more wise and modest to the world. And so they are. The king hath called his parliament, my lord. He hath. I will lay odds that ere this year expire, we bear our civil swords and native fire as far as France. Mm. I heard a bird so sing, whose music to my thinking pleased the king. Come, will you hence?
First my fear, then my curtsy, last my speech. My fear is your displeasure, my curtsy, my duty, and my speech to beg your pardons. If you look for a good speech now, you undo me, for what I have to say is of mine own making, and what indeed I should say will, I doubt, prove mine own marring. But to the purpose and so to the venture. Be it known to you, as it is very well, I was lately here in the end of a displeasing play to pray your patience for it and to promise you a better. I meant indeed to pay you with this, which if you like an ill venture and it come unluckily home, I break and you, my gentle creditors, lose. Here I promised you I would be, and here I commit my body to your mercies. Bait me some, and I will pay you some, and as most debtors do, promise you infinitely. And so I kneel down before you, but indeed to pray for the Queen. If my tongue cannot entreat you to acquit me, will you command me to use my legs? And yet that were but light payment to dance out of your debt. But a good conscience will make any possible satisfaction, and so would I. All the gentlewomen here have forgiven me. <laughs> if the gentlemen will not, then the gentlemen do not agree with the gentlewomen, which was never seen before in such an assembly. <laughs> One word more, I beseech you. If you be not too much cloyed with fat meat, our humble author will continue the story with Sir John in it and make you merry with fair Catherine of France, where, for anything I know, Falstaff shall die of a sweat, unless already he be killed with your hard opinions, for Oldcastle died a martyr, and this is not the man. Oh, my tongue is weary. Where my legs are too, I will bid you good night. <laughs>